uh, discussion on the bill before we work the bill. Senator Landon. Mr. Chairman, uh, thank you for just a moment. And I apologize for uh, being on a little bit slower horse than some. Can somebody help me with the Jason Flat Act um, and whereabouts I can locate that in the green books? Um, has anybody been able to uh, identify that? Because I missed it before lunch, tried to find it and could not. Well, I think we'd have to defer maybe maybe Senator Ellis or Matt Wellmarth. Matt. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman and Senator Landon. It's it's embedded in two separate uh, pieces of statute, and it's not referenced as the Jason Flat Act. That was the bill title in 2014. Um, but there are two charges. One is to the uh, superintendent of the public construction, uh, and then one is to the board of trustees. So for the state superintendent of public construction. It's in 212-202, uh, subsection A. It's part of her duties, uh, and it's paragraph 35. So 212-202A, paragraph 35. And then the second is part of the charge of the uh, uh, school boards of trustees. It's in uh, Wyoming Statute 213-110. I also believe that subsection A, and then paragraph um, 33. Okay, Senator Lannon, does that answer your questions before we go back to the hazing sure. bill? Thank you, and uh, Matt, I appreciate your help on that. Thank you. You bet, Mr. Chairman. Okay, committee, we're back on the hazing bill, LSO 0093, working draft 0 0.4. We do have a motion and a second on the bill. Is there a discussion before we work the bill? Representative Peeperinen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I enjoyed hearing the remarks from Brian Farmer. I was just curious um, if we had any superintendents listening, if they had any input with that. Well, clearly we didn't, Representative Peeperinen, because they, they had the opportunity, I think, for public comment. I think we've taken public comment already. Jay, I said correct. Mr. Chairman. Senator Roffus. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. To address Representative Pete Brennan's, uh question, though, we, we had some former uh, former superintendents participate in the in the drafting uh, that, that are, are since retired. Um, so we had that engagement when we were drafting through the working group. We didn't have any, any sitting or current superintendents, but uh, I, I think uh, we had good representation of, of K-12 uh, broadly in that group to, to kind of get their concerns. And I think Mr. Farmer did an excellent job really of, of representing what those concerns were, which is you know, some districts feel that they're already doing this. The, the thrust as Representative Brown noted and, and uh, I noted as, as well, is the, the effort by the university students, ASUW students, uh, we're very concerned about this because they see here and our, our Office of Student Affairs sees that there really isn't a lot of cohesive understanding of hazing uh, and that there's a lot of variation in interpretation of what is and isn't hazing because of an inconsistent definition. So even if there are policies in place, one of the real strengths of this bill is to try and get everyone on the same page with a, a common definition as the starting point. And then it, it provides districts with a strong opportunity to kind of do what they want with that definition and implement things the way they can. I hope that helps clarify. Any further discussion? Okay, committee, let's work the bill. We'll go through the bill real quick. Page one, any, any changes or amendments? Page two, any amendments? Changes? Page three. Page four, any amendments or changes? Page five. Page six. Page seven. Senator Office. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Based on the conversation and, and testimony, uh, I'd like to move to amend the dates. So on 
page seven, line 11, amend September 1st to November 1st. And then on line 18 of page seven, uh, change December 31st, 2021 to July 1st, 2022. That's the motion. That's the motion, sir. Second, seconded by Representative Brown. Discussion on the motion. Are you ready for the question? All in favor of the motion, raise your hand. That appears to be unanimous. That amendment is passed. We're back on the bill. Further, to Representative Freeman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. On uh, page seven, line 23, I think that this should be, this act should go into immediately upon the signature or the, the signing of all signatures. Okay, is that a motion, Representative Freeman? And there's a second by Representative Brown. Everybody understand the amendment? All in favor of the motion say aye or raise your hand. Opposed nay. Knows I have uh, Senator Ellis and Senator Hutchings, is that correct? And Senator Landon and Representative Simpson. Motion still passes. Mr. Chairman. Senator Roffus. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. I'd ask why uh, from, from those that voted against, I don't care much. So I'm, I'm just curious as we think about this, uh, what the concern is with getting it early. If anyone has any thoughts on that to share uh, as we think about this. Again, I, I don't care much, so I'm curious. Senator Ellis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, my concern is one of timing. Um, we're in a pandemic. I'm looking at my school district and all the work they're doing to make sure that we're staying open, staying safe, keeping our students safe. And, um, you know, it's 2020. I'd argue that this, this stuff should have been done years ago. Um, but is it urgent? Does it have to happen in the immediate? My answer would be no. I think it, in this time, I think we need to give them a little more flexibility. Okay. Any further discussion? Representative, excuse me, Senator Hutchings. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And to Senator Rothfuss, uh, I agree with Senator Ellis. That's why I was a no vote. Thank you. Okay. Thank Any you for that clarification. Discussion? Thank you. Okay, well, there's, there's nothing to vote on here or to change because the motion has already passed. Senator Ellis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I am... Um, I didn't want to take it page by page, but it would be, I'm going to move to um, substantially limit the scope of this bill to just apply to the University of Wyoming and their community colleges. And so it would require some conforming amendments, but the gist of it would begin on page two. I think um, on line 19, deleting that page, page three, or the remainder of that page, page three, page four, page five, and then going on to page six and then just limiting it to where the discussion comes into the University of Wyoming and then on page seven with community colleges. Was that a motion? Motion uh, Pender up? Is there a second? Seconded by Senator Hutchins. Discussion on the motion. Mr. Chairman. Senator Ellis. I appreciate what the, the, the bringers of this bill are trying to, to do. And I do think that, you know, in response to the university students and community college students um, expressing concern about maybe a lack of policy, um, I think that that's worth more consideration. And, you know, but we've heard from our school districts that a lot of them feel like this is already covered ground in their bullying policies. And so I don't wanna just create policy for the sake of creating it. Um, and again, just as one of timing, you know, we've got a lot going right now, and I just don't know that this needs to be the time for us to, I just don't know that I've heard that this is really an issue in K through 12 just yet that hasn't already been or can't be taken care of through existing bullying language. So that would, that's why the reason for the motion, vote your conscience up or down, I don't have a strong investment, but I just want to kind of raise that issue. Further discussion, Senator Roffus. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first of all, before I kind of get into discussion, um, as part of this motion, uh, Senator Ellis, the language on page two, the definition itself, uh, to make the motion work, that that's going to need to be relocated somewhere else because that's actually in K-12 statute. 
mm. and some definitions there that are related to some of the, the bullying and, and harassment language. So um, I would suggest as part of your motion that you amend that to find a more appropriate place for that language, uh, which would either be in, in the, the Commission for Community Colleges or the university um, as part of your motion to make sure the motion is, is internally consistent. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I was, uh, I thought that when I said a uh, conceptual and conforming amendments that that would kind of be encompassed. I, re I recognize that that's all Title 21 and that's not the right place. I was looking later on though in Title 21, that's where we talk about community colleges. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, if not there, then some other place, but you get the just conceptual amendment and the conforming all, obviously on page one. Yep. Okay, Mr. Chairman, Senator now, that we, now that we've got that straightened out, um, I'd ask the body to, to resist this. Really, the point of this legislation is a cohesive definition of hazing K through 16. Uh, that's the interest that's being advanced here. The idea that we have cohesion between the colleges and the university is actually quite secondary. And, and the reason that it was brought by the university and the students of the university uh, was based on a determination that a lot of folks here at the university didn't know what hazing was coming in because they had this multitude of definitions. So this amendment really breaks the bill. And if you don't like the bill, I understand that. And if you don't think this is the right time for it, I'm actually fine with, with uh, the previous motion of, of trying to make sure it goes into effect after the pandemic, July 1st. If this gets to session, we could certainly do that. Uh, but I'd ask you, even if you're going to vote against the bill, this amendment breaks the bill. So I'm going to ask you not to vote for it and then vote the bill up or down, quite honestly, uh, because it doesn't do what it's intended to do if this amendment's put in place. And again, it's a policy decision. Do we want a cohesive definition of hazing K through 16? We don't necessarily have to have that. That's something that's up to us to decide. But that was the request of the students here at the university. And I think we should try and honor the request as we move forward with the policy and try and, and either implement it or choose not to implement it. But to do something tangential to that, uh, really it, it defeats the spirit of the bill, the original intent of the bill and, and what we're looking for from a policy interest. So I'd ask uh, a no on the amendment and then really an up or down on the bill uh, if you would all be so kind. Further discussion on the amendment? Representative Freeman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I agree with uh, Senator Rothis. When I uh, read the materials um, this week, it was my intention to vote against the bill. I remembered the uh, the testimony uh, that um, most of the superintendents were talking about uh, that they've already did this. You know, this is something that they've done in in um, in uh, policy. It's just kind of a, a matter of um, uh, they didn't think it was necessary. I understand that. But as I listen to the discussion today, I think that a, a, um, a definition of hazing would benefit all. Um, and that's basically what this, this uh, bill does. And I think by putting the dates back it gives uh, people, the um, school districts, the time to, you know, to put uh, corresponding language in their existing policies to where they that it'd be covered. So it's it, it's more of a clarification um, to to help everybody out. So uh, I um, I urge the body to resist the amendment and support the bill. We're back on the amendment, Representative Brown. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, briefly, I will just echo what has already been said, but I will also state um, that the idea that we want to have uh, a, a, a definition of hazing for uh, kids coming out of high school and they're going to go to college and, and university, but we don't want to have that definition for kids in, in elementary school or in junior high school or in high school, it, it doesn't make sense to me. Um, that we, we want to make sure that we have cohesion at a, at a certain level, but not at other levels. Um, I, I just don't quite understand that concept um, personally. Um, I, I do agree with Senator Rothfuss on this, that if you don't like the bill, uh, absolutely vote against the bill. But 
Um, let's, you know, this was something that was, was vetted over the course of three to four weeks with multiple times that we met with uh, a lot of different stakeholders. And we had good consortium of stakeholders in, involved with this, and they all agreed that this was the right way to go about it. And, and uh, secondarily, we're not asking for a, a change in complete policy and direction with these school districts. We're, if you look at most of the bill, literally bullying and hazing is really what's added. And just about 95% of what these school districts are going to be able to do is add and hazing to their, their materials. And they're going to be able to develop their, their processes with adding and hazing as opposed to just bullying. So um, I, I would urge body to, to vote against this amendment as well. And then vote your conscience once it comes time to, uh, to actually have the bill. Thank you. Senator Ellis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm happy to withdraw my motion. Is the second okay with that? Who was the second? Senator Hutchins, are you okay if we withdraw the amendment? You know, I, um, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for asking. I, I'm a little concerned. I'm kind of going in line with keeping the amendment and then letting the people vote it up or down. And the reason why is um, we act as if students don't have the ability to look up a word and find the definition for it. If we're having a problem with hazing K through 12 um, and a student is concerned, I'm gonna go into college or UW or community college and there's gonna be hazing there. Let me see what their hazing policy is. Let me see what the definition of hazing is. If we don't think that they can do that on their own, I don't get it. I think, it's, this belongs in the community college and the university, not in K through 12. So I'm going to say, um, no, I'm not okay with it, but I'll let the dice roll as they may. Yes, yeah, Senator Hutchins, I might remind you if you're okay with withdrawal, then you can bring another amendment to bring it back if you want to, and then see if you get a second. But we have to deal with the motion and they sponsor the amendment. Senator Ellis okay. has agreed. I'll go ahead and say I'm going to agree to uh, withdraw it and um, just know I'll vote no on the bill. Thank you. Senator Hutchins has agreed. So the amendments off the table, we're back on the bill. Any further discussion? Are you ready for the question on the bill? Question. Matt or Josh, Josh, uh, do you have any comments be, uh, before we take roll? Um, I do have one comment, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, now, with the effective date of the bill being immediate uh, from that last amendment, um, the, there's no direction in that section two to the university and the community colleges onto when they would need to adopt these policies. And so it could be interpreted that they would have to essentially adopt some sort of policy immediately um, upon passage of the bill. So something you may want to consider, Mr. Chairman. Senator Roffus. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm gonna move for reconsideration of the motion, <clears throat> excuse me, to change the effective date to immediately. And that's not debatable. Uh, so it's just a, first of all, a vote on whether we reconsider that motion. And then the motion will be in its exact immediate prior position for a second vote as to whether or not you support changing the date to effective immediately, uh, recognizing what we just heard. So first on the reconsideration, uh, and I'd ask for a yes on the reconsideration, and it would be a no on the motion to take it back. Is there a second? I don't think there needs to be, but there are, yeah. Okay, we're on the, does everybody understand we're on the motion to reconsider that's non-debatable? All those in favor of the, of the motion to reconsider, raise your hand. Okay, that passes. Now we're back on. We're back on the original bill. On the motion itself for, for amendment, Mr. Chairman. Senator so, Roberts. Mr. Chairman, that would be a. We're on the motion now, yeah, back in exactly. its original position, to amend. We originally passed it and my contention would be now it'd be better to vote no. Okay, any further discussion on the motion? All in, fa all, all in favor, raise your right hand. 
Opposed, no. The no's have it. Now we're back on the bill. True. Question Are you ready the for the question on the bill? Ready for the question? Josh, you want to take roll on LSO 0093, working draft 0 0.4. All right, Mr. Chairman, this is for 21 LSO 93 as amended. Uh, Senator Ellis. No. Senator Hutchings. Yeah, you're Senator. muted, Senator Hutchins. Would you unmute, please? Sorry, sir. Um, no. Senator Landon. Aye. Senator Rothfuss. Aye. Representative Brown. Aye. Representative Connolly. Aye. Representative Flitner. No. Representative Freeman. Aye. Representative Obermuller. Aye. Representative Paxton. Aye. Representative Piperinen. Aye. Representative Simpson. Aye. Co-Chairman Northrop. Aye. And Co-Chairman Co. Aye. Will that pass, Mr. Chairman? House, House or Senate? House. Senator Brown and Senator Rothfuss can arm wrestle for it. Yeah. Yeah, Mr. Mr. Chairman, we'll if you started. Yeah, either way is fine. And if you want to look to balance later or something like that and switch it up, that's fine too. I don't know that we care. Okay. No. All right, committee. That bill passes. We're back on our agenda. I can tell you that the chairman this morning, Chairman Northrop, did a pretty good job keeping us on time. <laughs> uh, and I'm gonna see if I can even do a better job. Uh, the next item for our agenda is uh, our 145 agenda item. Wyoming Investment and Nursing Loan and Grant Program, Josh Anderson. And we have a draft legislation to consider. Josh, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Josh Anderson, LSO. So yeah, this is uh, 21 LSO 67, working draft 0 0.4. Um, this bill was requested at our last meeting um, and just kind of jump get right into the bill. It's, it's very simple. Um, this is to uh, address the, the portion of the exception budget request for the Wyoming Investment and Nursing Program that was uh, not approved uh, at our last budget session. Um, so you can see this is an appropriation of $264,459. Um, again, for that Wyoming Investment and Nursing Program. Um, the request was that this, uh, funding, um, if possible, come from come from CARES Act funds, and then to the extent it would not be able to come from CARES Act funds to come from the LSRA. And so you can see there on page two, uh, paragraph one, uh, that's where the CARES Act appropriation is, is located. And then over on the page three, paragraph two, that's where uh, the, any balance would come from the LSRA. Um, the rest of the bill is pretty much just uh, housekeeping uh, due to the nature of how those CARES Act funds are appropriated. Um, I would note that uh, at the end of the bill, this goes into effect immediately. Um, obviously, if there was a special session under the current, if there's not a special session, sorry, under the current uh, CARES Act directives, um, that those all expire uh, before this bill would become effective. Um, and with that, I'd stand for any questions, Mr. Chairman. Questions to Josh? Okay, committee, discussion on the bill. Is there any discussion on the bill? Okay, I'm gonna take uh, public testimony. I see we have Aaron Taylor in the waiting room and uh, I don't know, do we have anybody else? So I'll, I'll go to Erin Taylor, please proceed. Hi, good afternoon, members of the committee. My name is Erin Taylor. I represent the Wyoming Association of Community College Trustees. And I just wanted to express the college's support, of course, for augmenting this program for the Wyoming Investment and Nursing Program. It is something that's vitally important to all of the communities across the state. As you know, nursing programs are very expensive. 
to operate. And each of the seven women community colleges do have nursing programs, the demand for which exceeds, <clears throat> pardon me, exceeds their ability um, to fill those spots. So they're, they're really high demand, um, really uh, jobs that are really important across the state. And um, I know many of you are involved in the labor health community and you know the demands of those jobs uh, in our state right now. And so I just wanted to express our support for you. And if there's any information that you require, um, I'm happy to get that to the committee. Okay, questions of Aaron? Senator Landon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Aaron, uh, thank you for being here and uh, appreciate your thoughts on the investment in nursing. Uh, Bill, I'm curious, how um, have you in front of you or have you run across the information as to how much uh, capacity we have out there? Do we have the ability to expand these nursing programs or are we pretty much at, at the level we're going to be? Um, Aaron, go ahead. Mr. Chairman, Senator Landon, I would have to do a quick check, um, Senator, with the colleges to really find that out. I know, like I said, the demand, um, you know, they have more folks signing up for these programs than they have spots available. Um, the ability to expand, I'm not sure. So I would just have to get back with you on that. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Aaron. Representative Freeman, and then I'll go to Representative Flitner. Uh, I have a little bit of background based on my, uh, um, my experience being a board member. Um, it's hard to expand nursing programs. That's not saying that it can't be done, but you have problems with um, uh, uh, clinicals that you come up with enough uh, time and different places where that you can put the students at. The other thing is, is as a board member, we uh, we would have somebody resign from the nursing position and it was uh, very, very difficult to find new uh, instructors, uh, master uh, nurses to come in. Um, to preserve what we have, I think is very important. Uh, and someday we, we should probably talk about expanding that, especially as Wyoming ages. Uh, but um, I think it's very important to preserve what we have. Any further questions of Aaron? Okay, thank you. Oh, excuse me, Representative Flitner, go ahead. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Aaron, I appreciate your testimony. That's not very much money. How will you um, spread that out among the community colleges? How do you see that money being spent? Thank you. Aaron? Uh, Mr. Chairman, um, Representative Flitner, that is, um, that is a conversation that the Wyoming Community College Commission um, would probably best answer on how that um, would be allocated to the colleges. I think some of that would depend on to um, Senator Landon's question, the college's ability to expand and if they have um, the capability to have another staff person um, that would, the room, the clinical space, you know, Representative Freeman was right to um, be training those students. If they don't have the physical um, facilities, then they can't expand. Um, so I think it would depend on if they have the ability to expand and how the commission allocates those dollars. I'm sorry, I don't have the exact answer to how they do that, but that's the proper um, avenue for that to happen. I see Matt Wilmore, do you have a comment, Matt? Yeah, uh, Mr. Chairman, we, uh, we will admit uh, Sandy Caldwell and Larry Buckles from the commission uh, to provide some, I guess, uh, context on the commission side on how they would allocate that. I would say from the legislative standpoint, the commission did submit its exception request for this budget. It was a little over, it was about $1.1 million for the 21-22 biennium, $800 $28,100 was approved. So about 75% of the exception budget request was approved. So the 249 or 264,000 you see in the bill is the remaining 25% of that exception request. Thank you, Matt. Further questions of Aaron? Aaron, thank you very much. Oh, excuse thank me, Representative Connolly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And this might go for Matt as well as Dr. Caldwell, but I am curious if there is any 
conflict or any synergy between this bill and the request and what the com uh, community colleges or the commission put forward to the governor in terms of cuts to the community colleges. Mr. Okay. Chairman and, and Representative Connolly, to that question, my understanding of the, the kind of phase two cuts that were submitted from the commission uh, shielded this program. They weren't they were not included in those cuts, uh, but I'll defer to Dr. Caldwell and, and Mr. Buckholz to, to answer that further. Dr. Caldwell, see you in the waiting room. Would you like to comment? Yes, Mr. Uh, Chairman and members of the committee. And then um, we also have Mr. Buckles on here as well. Um, we can answer the question uh, on the how the funds would be distributed. This uh, This funding is the exact a cost for the faculty uh, that are associated with it. So it's distributed based on the actual faculty uh, cost. So it's not per allocation model, it is actually for the faculty per eight uh, students once that program is in, is in place. This is a, a shortfall for the total amount um, that it takes to make that whole which we would be um, having to take off the student grant amount. And I'll let uh, Mr. Buckles talk about that detail. And then in terms of the uh, step two budget cuts, um, this one was is not in uh, the list and the recommendation that the governor uh, made. It would uh, potentially come into play uh, for the step three or the 20% or the additional 10 on top of the 10%. Uh, cuts. And with that, if I may, I would like to let uh, Mr. Buckles add some specific detail around that. Thank you, Dr. Caldwell. Please go ahead, Mr. Buckles. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Larry Buckholt, CFO for the Community College Commission. Um, just to add a little bit more detail, um, what this would do is, is really makes the faculty side of the appropriation for the WIND program whole. Um, we have already fully funded the colleges for the first year of the biennium and reimbursed them for their faculty costs, which include benefits um, for fiscal year 21. This structurally right now, I don't have enough funding to fully fund the faculty in the second year of the program. So that shortfall of $265,000 would be proportionally spread out among all seven of them. They would get less than their total cost. Um, so that's how the allocation would happen for the second year of the biennium if this appropriation is not done. However, we do have still have the option, should there Mr. Buckles, I believe that Rep. Sonny Brown has a question. Uh, sorry to interrupt you. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Representative Chairman. Representative Brown. Mr. Buckles, just a quick question for you on that. You say you don't have the money in there, and I'm, I'm trying to remember this conversation, but it seems like it was three or four years ago, not just three or four months ago. Um, can you explain to me why we don't have the money um, sitting in there right now? Why the, the money's not available to, to make this completely whole? Uh, Mr. Chairman, Rep Representative Brown, um, it's, a, it's a couple of different factors. The program has grown over the course of the last few biennia, and we have never come back to the legislature asking for a, an exception request to fully fund the program. We always had money available in the form of carryover or um, to take money from the student side of the appropriation that wasn't being utilized and prop up the faculty side of things. The student side now is being utilized up to its capacity. So I don't have the, abil the, the ability to borrow from that side of the pot um, from the appropriation to do that. So there's been expansion of the program and I mean, that faculty get raises. Um, and we never, we never asked for an exception request for that either to, to buffer that appropriation. Follow up. Brown, follow up. So Mr. Breckles, on that, on that stance there, then I'm guessing you have probably read and reread the CARES Act as many times as it relates to this. Um, what is the likelihood that the CARES Act can be used for this as opposed to going the secondary option and, and digging into the other funding for this program? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Buckles, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Representative Brown. 
Uh, I'm not an attorney um, and I can't really express an opinion, but I have heard that it would not be an appropriate use of the CARES fund, um, the CARES Act funding. Thank you. That's what I thought. So I'd remind everybody that if uh, uh, we pass a bill and don't have a special session, we won't even have an option to, to consider the CARES Act funding. So, okay, further discussion from testimony, Mr. Buckholz, Dr. Caldwell. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, committee, discussion on the bill or the chair would entertain a motion on the bill. Is there a motion on the bill? So moved. Been moved by Co-Chair Northrop and seconded by Representative Connolly. Discussion on the bill. Senator Ellis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just procedurally, if we don't have a special session and we vote to have this be a committee bill, what happens to it um, in January? I'm just curious. Senator Ellis, the way I read the bill, if, 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 if we don't have a special session and have a chance to consider CARES funding, then it, the funding for it diverts to the LSRA, am I correct? Mm. So that's, that's the caveat there. So Mr. Chairman, read the bill right. Senator Ellis. Mr. Chairman, I guess that was my question is, so this is relevant with CARES. If there is no special session, but we vote on it today, what, what do we do with it in January? Do we just not act on it? That, I just want a little bit more clarification. I see Senator Rothfuss has his hand up. Senator Rothfuss, you want to comment on that? I think I know the answer. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Chairman. And that's exactly what we would do. It wouldn't have any real statutory effect. So we would just bury it, I assume, unless there was something else we saw we could do with it. We'd have the title to work within. If there was anything else useful to do. I guess I guess I, I misunderstood that. I thought that automatically, if it doesn't qualify for CARES funding, which would take a special session, because we don't start till January, it, it, would, it would defer to the LSRA. Yeah. Senator uh, Rafas. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, that's what would happen. I'm just saying that as far as what happens with the bill uh, from a process standpoint, I believe that was Senator Ellis's question. And mm -hmm. yeah, the bill stays alive. It, it's just a useless bill. <laughs> Representative Connolly, then I'll go to Senator Ellis. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I mean, I'm looking on page two, line 11, where that's the that's the reference to the CARES Act, which then includes the clause as may be amended. So, you know, it's possible that what Congress is working on right now might be an amendment. There could be an extension to the CARES Act. We honestly don't know. So, Senator Ellis, I mean, I think there's some wiggle room in here if there's an extension to the CARES Act, given that language right there. And then, honestly, a bill would just get sent to a committee on either the House side or Senate side and either come out of a drawer or not out of a drawer. Senator Ellis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I, the reason I'm asking is kind of to the points that are getting fleshed out right now is if you have a bill title that allows for, for some wiggle room, I just kind of want to understand any if anybody wants to chime in with a future intention to pick up this issue if we don't have a special session and you know the nursing issue in particular. So I just wanted to kind of gauge the committee to see if it would have a life beyond um, you know, assuming that we don't have that special session and CARES Act doesn't get extended or all those circumstances. Senator Office, then Representative Simpson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And to Senator Ellis's question, yeah, if you read the title itself, uh, it, providing funding for the Wyoming Investment in Nursing Program, providing appropriations, providing for an effective date, uh, you can drive just about anything you want through that title as it relates to uh, Wyoming Investment in Nursing funding. So Yes, it, it would. St if we pass this legislation and then we don't have a special session, which I actually don't think we probably will, but it's possible, uh, then we still would have this as a potential vehicle if we wanted to work on it and identify other ways that we could uh, help to to facilitate that program. Um, and yeah, I, I mean, I think we all support this program, and we're all, we're all looking for ways. I I assume to enable these objectives. Representative Simpson. Yeah, I, I'd like to draw your attention to page three, the first paragraph. It's, um, it's very specific there that this bill looks first to the CARES Act money. And second, if the CARES Act money does not develop, then we're pulling this out of the LISRA. So and obviously we can amend it as time goes on, but 
as it is written, this is loser money, because I think we all agree that it's not coming out of the CARES Act money because it's operation and maintenance, uh, which has been prohibited in the past. <clears throat> so this is a loser appropriation. Senator Landon, next. Well, Mr. Chairman, thank you. I, uh, Senator Roth, this really encompassed most of my uh, thoughts that I was going to share. I, uh, just for the record, I, I'm probably willing to keep this alive uh, simply because of uh, the comments that Representative Conley made, which, um, you know, there there might be some potential down the road for some modifications to the CARES Act. Uh, uh, funding, which uh, might benefit something like this. Um, I frankly am going to be honest. I think the, the bill is dead. I certainly won't vote for it uh, in the session if it's not CARES Act funding. We, we've got a lot of big fish to fry out of that LSRA, and this might not be one of them. So uh, I'll probably support just to send it forward, uh, just to keep the policy discussion alive. Uh, all under the heading of maybe the CARES Act funding will come through. Thank you. Further discussion? Any further discussion? Okay, I'm trying to remember, do we got a motion on the bill? I can't remember. We don't have a motion. The chair would entertain a motion on the bill. Oh. You, you do have a motion, Mr. Chairman. I made it. Senator, yep, that, that's right. Representative Northup moved it and it was seconded by who, who Josh? By Representative, Who seconded Representative, Representative Connolly, uh, Mr. Chairman. Okay, Representative Connolly. Representative Flitner. Mr. Chairman, thank you. If I may, could I propose an amendment before we vote? On yeah, we do have a motion on the bill. An amendment would be appropriate. I'm not going to work this page by page, so go ahead with your motion. Page three, lines one through six, I would like to delete. There's a motion on page three, lines one, two, six to delete paragraph two little I. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Representative Brown. Discussion on the motion. Is there further discussion on the motion? You ready for the question? Question. Senator Ellis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, you know, I think I understand the intent of where uh, Representative Flintner's going. I didn't know if it would make sense then to look at the title of the bill and just kind of narrow it. Um, providing funding for the Wyoming Investment Nursing Program from CARES Act funds, something along those lines. I don't know if you want to loop that kind of concept in, Representative Flitner. Josh, you got any comments on that? Um, that's fine with me, Mr. Chairman. A uh, policy choice for the for the committee. Okay, so Senator Ellis, is that an amendment to the amendment? No, Mr. Chairman. Um, if Representative Flitner wanted to address it, she can. If not, I, I'm fine with it. Okay. Mr. Chairman, I would take that amendment. Senator Rothfuss. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Uh, before it's taken as a friendly amendment, I, I would say just the, the implication of that, uh, if, if we all adhere to what we're supposed to adhere to, is that it would not then be a useful bill in any way during the session. If that's the objective, I just want to make sure that we all understand that it would definitely be expiring with the CARES Act funding and there would be no possibility of wiggling it through the title, which if that, I, if, I, th I think that might well be uh, Representative Flitner's intent, but I just want to make sure everyone knows that that's the outcome. Okay. That's the way I see it. Excellent. Representative Simpson. Mr. Chairman, in, a couple of weeks ago in the Agriculture Committee, we did two bills similar to this that was just strictly geared towards COVID-19 CARES Act money. And then as soon as we passed it, we directed the co-chairman to forward those bills directly to the governor with a cover letter, emphasizing that we'd like to see something in this nature, because you're right, there's ultimately it'll come to, to not, but that is an effective way to nudge the governor into considering that. Thank you, Representative Simpson. Other comments? Senator Landon. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you. And just to pick up on Representative Simpson's uh, good comments, um, the, the executive branch has actually been uh, pretty responsive, and I would uh, give them kudos. Uh, having served on the broadband task force, 
a couple of other efforts in, in May and June, um, having sent those forward as mentioned by Representative Simpson, they've been well received. And so uh, it's not like this is only headed for the session uh, and no place else. I think, it, I think it would be something that could be sent to the executive branch knowing that it receives support from a committee, uh, depending upon whether or not we support it. Thank you, Senator Landon. Okay, we're on the Flettner Amendment. Everybody understand it? Mr. Senator Chairman, Ellis. Thank you. I feel comfortable voting for it if we've got the limitation that CARES funding is going to be used. I think once we start talking about funding it through different mechanisms, I think it becomes a much larger conversation about where that those funds are coming from, what are we taking away from? We've got tight budgets right now. And I just think that that's larger than what we're discussing right now. And so when it carries that brand of being a committee bill, it's a well-vetted idea from the committee. And when we start tinkering with it later on, I, I don't think it carries the same weight. And so that, that's my reason for wanting to limit it. I don't think it's a bad idea to want to work on it. But um, you know, as we're looking at it today, it's a CARES Act funding bill and not a LISRA bill or a you know, we're going to raise taxes bill to pay for it, that kind of thing. I just want to be very clear. Definitely a CARES Act funding bill right now if we pass this amendment. Representative Obermuller. Uh, just to be clear, Mr. Chairman, so Representative Flitner is going to include this in her amendment? The way I see it. Uh, yeah. what's that, are we voting on a Flitner amendment that includes the change of the title? That's my question. That's my interpretation, Senator Office. Do you see it that way? Everybody else see it that way? Yeah, that's exactly what we're voting on. Okay, we're on the Flitner Amendment to delete lines one through six on page three. All in favor of that motion, raise your hand. I count 10, all opposed, raise your hand. Three, 10 to three, that motion has been adopted. We're back on the bill. You ready for the question on the bill? Question. Question, question being called for. Josh, you wanna take roll on LSO 0067, working draft 0 0.4. Mr. Chairman, this is 21 LSO 67 as amended. Senator Ellis. Aye. Senator Hutchings. No. Senator Landon. Um, aye. Senator Rothfuss. Aye. Representative Brown. No. Representative Connolly. Aye. Representative Flitner. Aye. Representative Freeman. Aye. Representative Obermuller. Sorry, aye. Representative Paxton. Aye. Representative Pieperinen. Aye. Representative Simpson. Aye. Co-Chairman Northrop. Aye. Co-Chairman Co. Aye. That's passed, Mr. <laughs> Chairman. Okay, committee, thank you very much for your work. Um, trying to keep us on schedule. Next agenda item. Excuse me, Representative Simpson, go ahead. Mr. Chairman, I move that we direct the co-chairman to draft a letter and forward this last bill that we just approved on to the governor. You know, Representative Simpson, I'm not sure that we need a motion to do that, to have that be a matter of the record. I think you can, can request that. And if, if there's no objection, the chairs will just do that. Is that uh, is that the way to do that, Josh? Okay, if there's no objection, the chairs will draft a letter and send it to the governor. Thank you, Representative Simpson. Moving on with our agenda. This is the 215 agenda. I'll be darn, we're about 10 minutes early. That's what a good chairman does. K-12 recapture schedule on county treasurer disbursements. We have Josh Anderson, Josh. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, this is 21 LSO 66 working draft 
Um, this bill we discussed briefly at the last meeting. Um, this comes out of uh, just a kind of a cleanup uh, resulting from the monthly payment of ad valorem taxes on minerals that was passed last session. Uh, so due to that bill, it changes the timing of when the final payment of uh, uh, mineral product taxes will come in to the counties uh, for the first few years of that transition. So previously the final payment would have been in May and now it's moved back to uh, June 10th. So uh, it causes some issues with uh, the timing of recapture payments. So this does a couple of things. If you look on page two, line 13, it changes uh, the date of uh, payment of the recapture payment from June 15th to June 25th. Makes the same change at the on page three, line one. Uh, again, changing that date to from June 15th to June 25th. And then the remainder of page three is uh, when those uh, funds are provided from the county treasurer uh, to the county school fund. Um, it's currently on the second Monday, um, but this year that would have been June 8th and these payments wouldn't come in until June 10th. So it says, so it'd be the second Monday plus on June 20th or last business day before June 20th uh, to account for that uh, last payment of, of those mineral product taxes. And with that, I stand for any questions, Mr. Chairman. Any questions to Josh? Okay, discussion on the bill. Is there a discussion on the bill? I think we talked about this at our last meeting and that's why we see the bill in front of us now. Okay. Um, I think bill. I'll go. Second. It's been moved by Mr. Representative Chairman. Or seconded by Representative Mr. Freeman. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. Before we have a motion, office, yeah, I'm going to take public comment. Yeah, we should do that before we have the motion, I think. Yeah, we should do that before we have the motion. So the first person I see is Janine Bateski. Janine, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, first of all, let me begin by if I can backtrack a little bit about Don Richard's presentation this morning. And I think that we should really commend ourselves for the transparency that Wyoming has on uh, our education funding, which is really not available for all the other states that have been mentioned. Brian Farmer and I have been working to try and find out, you know, as we look at their taxation, how much of it's going to education, and it is not nearly as simple as it is in, here in Wyoming. But um, I just wanted to comment on this proposed legislation. We really have no issue with it, but I just wanted to remind us all that Teton County is really doing more than its fair share uh, on uh, recapture. At the present time, we are targeted to send $13,294,000 of taxpayer dollars back to the state. And this is really attributable to the fact that the assessed valuation in Teton County continues to escalate at really crazy rates. My property taxes alone went up 32% this year. And I just hope that as we continue to move forward that we remember this as we uh, consider how much it costs for our employees to live in Teton County. And um, as we're con considering the effects of the pandemic, it's been kind of interesting and Co-Chairman Co, I think you're probably experiencing some similar things is I think this escalation is continuing to rise as a result of the pandemic, because we are seeing an influx of folks that want to get away from places where the pandemic has hit hard, for example, New York, Texas. Um, and um, consequently, our ADM this year has gone up over 100 students already. So I just wanted to bring that to the committee's attention and I stand for any questions you may have. Thank you. Yeah, I'd just like to follow up and say over here, it's the same way. And you alluded to that. Uh, people are buying homes virtually, sight unseen, uh, with no inspections. Uh, it's just, and the inventory is gone. They're pretty much gone around here. Senator Landon. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Just to add to some great comments, Jenny, thank you for that. Um, just to add to the conversation, um, we took a trip up to Big Sky uh, about a month ago 
uh, where our son lives and helps to run that ski resort up there. Mm. Uh, Big Sky is an unincorporated town. And it's remarkable how many people they have seen move to Big Sky permanently. They came this summer. Normally, they're there two weeks out of the year living in the big homes. But now they've decided to live there and came to the town and said, we're just going to send our kids to school here. Uh, up there in that particular unincorporated town, they were able to say, no, I don't think so. I'm sorry. Uh, you can't send your kids to school here because we don't have the infrastructure, the teachers, the wherewithal to take care of your kids for you. So here in Wyoming, I think that same thing is going on as Ms. Teske just uh, testified to. And, and so, uh, well, guess what? Um, we need to accept the ADMs and away we go. But uh, I thought that was interesting what, what I learned up there in, in uh, Montana. But just one other reminder is that the two big causes of the um, increasing cost of education in the state of Wyoming are health insurance costs and ADM. Further questions for Janine? Any further questions? Okay, Janine, thank you very much. Do we have anybody else in the waiting room to testify on this bill? Anybody else in the waiting room? I don't think so. So now I'll take a motion on the bill. Been moved by Representative Flintner and seconded by Representative Freeman and a couple others who I don't even care to recognize. <laughs> Any amendments on the bill? It's a it's a uh, three pager. Any amendments on the bill, Senator Ellis? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I don't have a question, but I or I don't have any amendments, but I do have a question about why it was assigned to education and not revenue. I have no idea, Josh, or Josh or Matt. Excuse me, uh, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, just. It was primarily an issue with the, the recapture payment only. So that's why it ended up in education, um, but uh, certainly could have gone to revenue as well. I don't know if Matt has anything to add. Matt, anything? No, Mr. Chairman, I, Josh covered it. Okay. Further discussion on the bill. Is there any further discussion? Question. You ready for the question on the bill? Josh, would you take roll on 0066 working draft 0 0.3? Chairman, this is for 21 LSO 66. Senator Ellis. No. Senator Hutchings. You were muted, Senator Hutchings. Aye. Senator Landon. Aye. Senator Rappas. Aye. Representative Brown. Aye. Representative Connolly. Aye. Representative Flitner. Aye. Representative Freeman. Aye. Representative Obermuller. Aye. Representative Paxton. Aye. Representative Pete Berenin. Aye. Representative Simpson. Aye. Co-Chairman Northrop. Aye. Co-Chairman Coe. Aye. That's okay. Powerful. The the new chairmans can determine how they want to spread out the workload, I guess. That's David and I are a couple of lame ducks. Or as I said, uh, I'm not a lame duck, I'm a dead duck. With that, we'll go on to our next agenda item. Um, University of Wyoming Governance, Amanda Prude and Jonathan Sandoval. Welcome, Amanda. Do you want to proceed? Mute. Can you yeah, all hear ahead, me now? Thank you, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the Joint Education Interim Committee. In response to a request made by the committee at its June 2020 meeting, LSO reviewed shared governance issues raised by the Higher Learning Commission, also known as HLC's 2019 University of Wyoming Accreditation Final Report. Although the University of Wyoming met all criteria for accreditation, HLC did identify weaknesses in the report pertaining to shared governance at the university. Along with discussing the weaknesses found in the HLC 
governance report, LSO's short report includes a literature review of research discussing shared governance, along with describing governance practices of surrounding states land grant universities accredited by HLC. HLC uses five criteria for accreditation as the standards of quality by which HLC determines whether an institution merits accreditation or reaffirmation of accreditation, which can be found on page one of the report. As previously stated, the university did successfully meet all five HLC accreditation criteria, including those which assess shared governance practices. However, the HLC report did identify two weaknesses re with respect to shared governance, which will be the focus of our presentation today. The weaknesses identified are number one, no requirement for the board of trustees to seek internal or external um, input during its decision-making process. And number two, the overreach by the board in the day-to-day -day management of the university. I will present on the first weakness discussed in the short report of having no requirement for the board to seek input from internal or external constituents during its decision-making process, a literature review of the best practices in seeking input and the review of governance structures and accreditation reports for four land grant universities and surrounding states pertaining to seeking input from constituents. To conclude the presentation, my colleague Jonathan will focus on the overreach by the board in the day-to-day -day management of the university, best practices, and the comparative states when assessing day-to-day -day management. The HLC report noted University of Wyoming's board did seek feedback and public input prior to some decisions, but not others, which raised concern across the campus. While there is no requirement for the board to seek input, the HLC report found that input sought is a function of the current board's goodwill, and there's no assurance input will be continued to be solicited in the future. When reviewing benefits and best practices in research and literature, LSO review, um, literature review regarding internal and external constituents in the decision making process can be found on page five of the report. These are as followed. The value of shared governance adds institutional progress and innovation and how the responsibility and accountability for addressing institutional challenges often rest in multiple parties. Shared governance provides each internal constituent group with primary authority over its area of expertise, including a voice and decisions affecting the programs, the organizations and the traditions of the university and institution. Shared governance builds social capita, capital, including relationships of trust and cooperation, which enables an institution to fulfill its goals. And although governing boards hold ultimate authority for an institution as defined by bylaws and other foundational documents, authority is delegated to institutional leaders and faculty through shared governance. Many times presidents are charged with institutional leadership strategic planning and daily management of the institution, whereas faculty are charged with educational design and delivery. The importance of including faculty members in the decision-making process along with receiving input from other internal and external constituents can assist governing boards to make more informed decisions with the input of the subject matter experts. And while faculty are often the primary internal stakeholder in shared governance, Additional internal stakeholders can include academic and co-curricular support professionals, such as student and financial aid advisors, career counselors, and technology support, all of whom contribute to the academic mission and are crucial for student success at institutions. Research also stated institutional boards should ensure open communication with all campus constituents, including staff. This group of internal constituents have a vital stake in the institution and should be given the opportunity to be heard on various issues and participate in the governance process. And lastly, boards do play an important role in relating their institutions to external constituents as well. Governing boards should serve as buffers between the university and the political structures, partisan politics, and the pressures of state government 
The board should serve a bridge to state government leaders whose views and perspectives concerning the conduct of public higher education as it relates to state needs and priorities should be heard and considered. As stated earlier, LSO reviewed the governance structures and accreditation reports for four land grant universities and surrounding states, states that like the University of Wyoming are also accredited by HLC. These, state, these institutions were Colorado State University, North Dakota State University, South Dakota State University, and the University of Nebraska. LSO reviews focused on each university's shared governance structure, including collaboration with internal and external constituents and each university's board's role with regards to university management, including the appointment or hire of university administrators. In terms of the board structure and governance, both similarities and differences existed among University of Wyoming and the four comparative universities. And these all can be found on page eight of the report. Some of these include four out of the five universities have their voting board members appointed by the governor with the University of Nebraska's voting members elected within districts. None of the five universities have voting faculty board members. However, pursuant to state constitutions and or statutes, Colorado State University, North Dakota State University, and South Dakota State University have faculty representation as part of their governing boards as non-voting members. This does differ from the University of Wyoming and the universities of Nebraska as neither institution include faculty board members. In fact, Wyoming statute specifically prohibits faculty members from serving as a board member. And with respect to student representation, all four comparative university boards include student representatives on their board. Only two universities, however, allow the student to student representatives to vote. And these institutions were North Dakota State University and South Dakota State University. When it comes to seeking input from external and other internal constituencies, the four comparative universities do not have any specific requirements in their constitution or statutes. However, all the comparative universities do take steps to ensure that their boards seek this type of input in order to make more informed decisions regarding the institutions they do govern. Examples of how the four comparative universities fulfill this goal are found on page nine of, of the report and include providing open segment at meetings to allow stakeholders to address issues, faculty senate presidents speaking at meetings, including student faculty and staff representatives on universities governing bodies and also conducting meetings on campus to ensure familiarity and providing an opportunity for all constituents to attend and speak at meetings. That now concludes my portion of the presentation and I will now direct your attention to Jonathan as he discusses the second weakness HLC included in the University of Wyoming's accreditation report. Questions of Amanda before we go to Jonathan? Okay, thank you, Amanda. Jonathan, please proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Now that Amanda has explained the first weakness HLC found, I will continue with the discussion on the second weakness. First, I will start at the bottom of page three if you would like to follow in the short report text. The second weakness identified by HLC was overreach by the board in the day-to-day -day management of the university. HLC stated that although university regulations allow for the day-to-day -day management of the university to be delegated to the administration and faculty, there's been a weakening of shared governance at the university. The main issue that HLC focused on that caused the weakening within day-to-day -day management was the appointment and hiring of administrative officers. Appointments are made through the board of trustees rather than delegated to the university president or provost providing the board with leverage over university management. Second, as discussed previously, LSO conducted a review of shared governance research with an emphasis on best practices. Discussion of the second weakness, overreach by the board in day-to-day -day management is continued in the best practices section at the bottom of page six under the heading board role in institutional management. We found that there are several best practices that relate to day-to-day -day management. For example, many, boards gov many governing boards spend their time on perfunctory review and routine reports 
instead of focusing on strategic long-term cross-cutting issues that impact the institution as a whole or multiple departments across the institution. Focusing on long-term issues of strategic importance allows the board to resist the temptation to micromanage operational decisions. Micromanaging by the board can lead to confusion between governance factions, including administrative officers and faculty. President board relationships are important and a trusting relationship between, and a trusting relationship can allow the board to focus on long-term strategic issues. Tensions between boards and presidents can lead to board presidential turnover, which can cause instability and undermine the strategic focus of the board. Surveys performed by the Association of Governing Boards suggest that support for shared governance is broad, but boards and faculty do not have a strong understanding of each other's contributions. This lack of understanding can lead to a friction between governing constituencies in the day-to-day -day management of an institution. The best practices we found that are relevant to day-to-day -day management of institutions tend to focus on the relationships between boards and faculty and between boards and presidents. However, we were unable to find best practices directly addressing the weakness HLC focused on, the hiring and firing of administrative officers by the board. Finally, at the bottom of page nine, we discuss how the University of Wyoming compares to comparative universities compares to the comparative universities that Amanda previously de detailed in regard to day-to-day -day management. Specifically, University of Wyoming regulations confer the authority on the Board of Trustees to appoint and fire specific administrative officers, and the authority is not delegated. The same managerial structure is not present at the four comparative universities. All four comparative universities have some sort of delegation practice or policy in place for the appointment of appointment and firing of administrative officers, and each delegates the authority to their respective presidents. How the comparative university accomplishes this delegation for the appointing and firing of administrative officers is different for each university. Colorado statute delegates the authority to appoint and dismiss administrative officers at Colorado State University. The University of Nebraska delegates authority in their Board of Regents bylaws. The North Dakota Constitution delegates authority for North Dakota State University with specifics found in board policy. South Dakota State University delegates authority in their Board of Regents policy manual. In terms of faculty powers and, admit, faculty powers and academic affairs and day-to-day -day management, the University of Wyoming is similar to the other four compared to universities in that faculty have the immediate control of colleges and departments. As a result of the two identified weaknesses discussed throughout the short report, HLC recommended that the university carefully review shared governance. In July 2019, the vice provost and chair of the faculty synod invited five senior faculty members to assume a leadership role in exploring and improving shared governance at the university. The vice provost requested the group develop a draft shared governance report addressing best practices and recommendations for restructuring of procedures or processes that may need to be may need to, to be successful in shared governance. The preliminary draft had a deadline of March 31st, 2020, but has since been extended to the fall of 2020 due to extenuating circumstances. We also put together Appendix A following the short report, which goes into further detail on the comparison between the University of Wyoming and the University of Wyoming and the comparator states. The table is information regarding governing board title, board composition and selection, faculty representation, student representation, board powers and duties, the board's authority to hire and fire generally, and in relation to administrative officers, authority to appoint president, faculty powers and duties, and gives quotes from HLC on the two weaknesses discussed in the short report for all five universities. If you want more information and to be able to, to further compare the universities, you may be able to find that in the appendix A. Thank you for your time. Amanda and I will now stand for questions. Questions for Amanda or Jonathan. Senator Rafis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. But before we get to questions, I just wanted to say great work to Amanda and Jonathan. This is a very thorough report, very well researched, and it gets at, I think, the questions that we really had last time. So um, I'm certainly appreciative of the work that you've done. And there's a lot, I think, to really dig into here and, and to understand better. But uh, this is very helpful for us, and I probably will have some questions, but I'll stop there and, and just offer my appreciation to both of you. Thank you. Thank you. I also find the information very informative, and uh, you know, with where we started with this topic as delegated by a management council, 
we weren't quite sure where we were going to go or how we we're going to end up here and i'm not sure where we will end up but the information is very helpful senator landon well mr chairman thank you and I, I echo those comments that's kind of where i was going i um i think it's helpful and, and maybe everybody is pretty well aware of what hlc is and what these accreditation visits are all about and having written a couple of those documents uh, at the college where I worked, they, they came every 10 years and it's, it's an all encompassing, uh, overwhelming sort of process that you go through and you have these visits uh, from your peers and um, knowing up front that, that their intention is to try to find some things. On the other hand, um, some of the things can rise to a level that would, that would threaten an accreditation or whatever. It sounds like to me, and this is kind of a question, Amanda, probably for you, these, uh, these two weaknesses that came as recommendations, that's a level below, it's been a while for me, so I'm not sure what the levels are anymore, but um, some recommendations are much more egregious and carry much more weight than say something like a recommendation, is that correct? Uh, this did not obviously rise to a level where it threatened the accreditation of the institution. Can you help me with that? Mr. Chairman, Senator Landon, um, this did not affect them meeting the criteria for the areas. They met the criteria and passed. However, they, HLC just provided some type of recommendation that they could focus on. Um, so the weakness does not continue or get deeper than it already is. But they met all five criteria for accreditation and it did not affect their accreditation rating. Further questions of Amanda or Jonathan? Representative Mr. Connolly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And let, let me just begin by saying thank you too to Amanda and Jonathan. But as a partial response to Senator Landon, if I remember reading that whole report when it, it came out from the HLC. And I think you did a great job in, in, in pulling out what was important for us to look at. But I think there was also a clause in there ahead of time that said something along the lines of because the university doesn't have any rules regarding shared government governance, then it's not in violation of its own rules. And so they're not going to be marked down because they weren't violating. If they had violated a shared governance rule, they could have been marked down and it might have risen to a higher level. But what they found very surprising was that there were no rules. And so that's where the recommendations came in, that there's a need for those rules. And I think what Amanda and Jonathan illustrated is that they exist elsewhere and the university recognized it as well. But again, because they didn't violate their own internal rules, they weren't going to be found in violation. Um, but if I may just kind of go on to something a little different, it seems to me that this is a, a topic that, that was assigned for two years to take a look at, that there is a, another report that will not be LSO, so you probably won't be happy about that, but it looks like the university has assigned five high level individuals to take a look at this, and we should expect a, another report, a different report from them sometime this fall. And I guess I would hope that they would have it done by our meeting in November. Representative Flitner. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Amanda, I wonder if you could uh, tell me the history of um, having no um, faculty member, even as a non-voting member on the on the board, or if, does that go back to the, you know, the very beginnings of the university or do, or do you have that answer? Mr. Chairman, Representative Flitner, I do not have the information readily available. However, I'm happy to gather that to you and to distribute to you and the committee at a later time. Okay, thank you. Further questions of Amanda and Jonathan? Any further questions? Senator Landon. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Um, uh, Amanda and or Jonathan, uh, I see where North Dakota, the state university there is, is uh, governed by a state board of higher education. Does that uh, state board oversee the community colleges in that state? 
um, I don't need to ask in South Dakota because that state doesn't have community colleges, but what about North Dakota? Uh, Mr. Chairman, Senator Landon, uh, the, this, the North Dakota State Board of Higher Education uh, does um, oversee the community college. Okay, thank you. I've got, I've got a question, I guess, uh, you know, living as close as I do to Montana, you know, Montana has like seven four-year institutions and they also have community colleges and they have a board of regents in Montana. I don't know if you looked at Montana, but I just bring that up because I live right next door to them. And I guess the same question goes uh, when it comes to community colleges. Do you have any idea what they do in Montana? Mr. Chairman, uh, we, we did not specifically look at Montana because uh, we were we picked out the land grant universities okay. in the surrounding states that, that uh, had an HLC accreditation. Okay, thank you. Other questions of Amanda or Jonathan? Any other questions? Mr. Chairman? Senator Rafa, sorry, almost missed you. No worries. Which Mr. is hard Chairman. to do. <laughs> um, I, I do have a question. One of the organizations that was brought up and was your source for best practices was the Association of Governing Boards of Universities and Colleges. Uh, and it's my understanding that the University of Wyoming is a member of that organization. Is that right? May not know, which is okay. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Senator Rothfuss, I, I do believe they are, but I would need to, to double check okay. and get that information back to you later. And Mr. Mr. Chairman, the, the, the committee will recall the, the original budget footnote that we're operating under and as, as Representative Connolly pointed out, this is a, a two-year project for us, and I think we've got more exploration ahead and, and more investigation ahead before we would want to take any action. But the budget footnote actually required that we bring on a, a third-party consultant to conduct a study and provide some recommendations. Uh, we're using the Higher Learning Commission kind of as a proxy due to the budget shortcomings and the fact that we, we didn't have a lot of money floating around. But it seems to me that it would be worth reaching out to this organization, the Association of Governing Boards of Universities and Colleges, that, that really does study this very thing, the, the role of boards of trustees with respect to shared governance, and see if they have any best practices or recommendations or reports that we could be looking at as well. Uh, or if they work for free, if we can get them <laughs> to look at the university or, or maybe even find out what they, what they would bill us to do kind of a cursory review uh, so that we can try and get that outside look as well from an organization that's specifically familiar with uh, best practices in shared governance. So I guess that would be my ask as we sort of, as we move forward and then we will eventually look at the report uh, that they have do on shared governance from the university. Uh, would that be something that we can look into? Jonathan Comment? or Amanda? Jonathan or Amanda? Um, I'm uh, Mr. Chairman, Senator Rothfuss. I'll probably refer to Matt for that question. Great. Matt, Matt Wilmarth. Mr. Chairman, you bet. We, we can uh, certainly coordinate with uh, Jonathan and Amanda in, in our office and, and work with AGB to see what they're, um, see if they could even provide us a, a, a bit on what some of this uh, work would do, but also see what kind of best practices literature they have on, on file. And I know uh, we've seen a couple of reports from them, uh, but if they have a specific on land grant universities right. or um, any just literature that they have available that they can pass along um, at no cost. Excellent. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Further questions of Amanda or Jonathan? Well, I'd just like to say thank you. I mean, mm -hmm. this is more than I expected. Uh, really good information. Yeah. You guys really did a great job and, and uh, really appreciative of that, that, that you bring to the committee uh, for our consideration. So uh, being no further questions of Amanda or Jonathan, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, committee. Uh, under the great leadership here, we're now we're significantly ahead of schedule. I knew I'd have to pick the pieces up from the, the co-chair from this morning. I think we'll go ahead. 
uh, even though we aren't scheduled for a break till 3.20, I think we'll take a 10 minute break and come back and start uh, our last agenda item 14, which has four bullet points to it. So with that, uh, let's come back in at 2.50. Thank you.
Hey, Dickey. Mr. Chairman. I'm just curious, how's April? She's doing great. Just okay. uh, helping with her six grandbabies a lot. Well, good. Give her my best when you see her. I haven't I've heard a word from her for a long time, so. I will. President Seidel, welcome. Thank you. Pleased to be here. Pleasure seeing you last week on Minerals, so it's good to see you again. Well, that must have been on YouTube. Somebody's got their YouTube on. That was me. I shut it off. <laughs> okay. As tech savvy as I am, as Senator Landon really knows, and for office, and I'm not really sure what YouTube is all about, to be honest with you. See if we got a quorum. I not quite. Now we got one, two. Three. I don't think we have a quorum yet. There's Senator Ellis. I've got a mischievous dog here, Mr. Chairman. Hold on. <laughs> Here's Michelle Brandt in the governor's office. One, two, one, two, three, four, five is all I show. Is anybody else counting? There's six with Representative Simpson. There's Chairman Northrop, that's seven. Representative Paxton. I think we've got a quorum of the university here, though. We've got a quorum of the university. Representative Conley's here. And, and we've got a quorum of the, uh, the university legislators. As a matter of fact, we have almost all of them, except for FERPI. Okay. I'll call the meeting back to order. Uh, the first item on our agenda is general update from the Department of Education re related to K-12 district school year 2021. CARES funding, relief fund, Dickie Shane or Shelley Hamill. Please proceed, whoever wants to take, take over. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and committee members. As you said, this is Dickie Shaner and our Chief Academic Officer, Shelley Hamill from the Department of Ed. And I am going to share my screen right now pull up our um, PowerPoint for you. Let's see here. All right. Boy. Is that working okay, Mr. Chairman? Is that PowerPoint showing? PowerPoint is showing, Dickie. Go ahead. Great. Thank you. Uh, so we are going to provide a general update on schools reopening and then also on some of the CARES funding that has gone to schools. The four topics we will touch on are uh, school year 2020-21, which just started uh, this fall, and the work that went into uh, that over the summer leading into this fall. The second is what we call ESSER funding, which was the CARES Act funding that went straight to school districts uh, by formula. The third are CARES Act funds that came to the state of Wyoming in the form of the 1.25 billion uh, that were allocated towards school districts for purchasing PPE. And fourth, uh, we'll touch on testing of staff and students, both with the Department of Health as well as a recent development uh, as of this week with the White House in terms of some rapid testing uh, from Abbott Labs that they're distributing to states. So with that, Mr. Chairman, number one, talking about reopening schools, and I just want to uh, harken back to uh, March when this all started and really uh, everyone scrambling to figure out how to make the school situation work. 
Uh, thankfully, the wisdom of the legislature uh, over the years did have a statute that contemplated widespread illness and closures as a result of widespread illness. Uh, we were able to use that statute in order to um, close schools to in-person instruction for students, uh, but allow staff and faculty to still use those facilities uh, to deliver education remotely to students. And we called that process adapted learning. Uh, and those adapted learning plans uh, laid out each school district's uh, plan for delivering remote education during those times of closures. And during that time of closure, uh, the schools were functioning and delivering education through those adapted learning plans. And so after that school year ended and we remained in, in that closed uh, adapted learning uh, phase, we immediately began work in the summer with our state agency partners and with local school districts on uh, developing our plans for reopening. And uh, the formal process that we used for that was um, off of the governor's COVID-19 task force, which Superintendent Bela was the chair. Uh, we had a subcommittee that we called our Smart Start Reopening Committee, which was chaired by uh, Wanda Maloney from the Department of Ed and Stephanie Pyle from the Department of Health. And then that task force had uh, district superintendents, school nurses, teachers, uh, healthcare officials, uh, and then some different organizations from across the state, everybody putting their heads together and trying to figure out what would, what would be the most helpful to schools uh, in order to open in the fall. And we called that our Smart Start Guidance that's available online on our website. Uh, and then every school district submitted a Smart Start plan to the Department of Ed um, that was subsequently reviewed by staff and the superintendent so that in the case of a full closure again, um, or even a partial closure uh, in this school year, we have a plan in place for how to deal with that uh, at the state level and at the local level. And on this next slide, we, um, we, we organized the Smart Start guidance uh, based around what would be sort of three health scenarios uh, that could occur that are, uh, you know, potentially all, that are already occurring uh, with this school year. So tier one uh, is, is open. Uh, that means we have in-person classes and activities going on, probably some remote learning, virtual learning, different blended uh, activities, but for the most part, school is open of course, with uh, the, the health protocols in place. Tier two, which is a hybrid scenario where um, you may have a positive case in one school or part of a school or multiple schools uh, resulting in a short-term closure uh, for sanitation purposes. Uh, and that's a, a time where you, know, you have to close that facility down and then move into sort of adapted remote learning uh, for those students who can't go in their school until the sanitizing is done. Um, and then tier three is fully closed again. So tier three would be uh, just like we had uh, last spring where there was a statewide order that closed all schools. Uh, there are three school districts that are in tier three right now. Those are the three on the reservation because the reservation still has a tribal health order uh, that requires stay at home. Uh, so those three districts are um, under their tier three close, doing what they did last semester, uh, and the rest are moving in tier one with uh, one in tier two. To uh, just close the loop on that, um, like I said, there's 44 in tier one. Teton is in tier two because their health officers put some uh, additional restrictions at the county level on how many students can be in a classroom and um, it's kind of a, a gray area between tier one and tier two. So we've classified it as tier two. That's what their board is calling it. Uh, and then of course the three districts and St. Stephen's on the reservation. Uh, we don't know what enrollment looks like yet, uh, but we do know that there, um, we will be getting that snapshot October one. So we'll have more information to report at the next meeting. And I just wanted to mention too, how great of a partner the Department of Health has been through all of this. Um, we have worked daily with them daily with the governor's office. Um, and I just, I can't imagine trying to get through this um, situation without the, the collaboration that we've had uh, with all of our state and local district partners throughout this process. 
So before we move into the ESSER funding and the CARES funding, Mr. Chairman, I'd be happy to answer any questions. I think you're on mute. Any questions to Dickey? Seeing none, please proceed, Dickey. All right, thank you, Mr. Chairman. At this time, I will have Shelly Hamm will discuss the ESSER fund process. All right, good afternoon. Um, and looking at number two of our presentation, I am gonna talk about the elementary and secondary school emergency relief fund, which we call the ESSER uh, fund. Um, as we all know, we've spoken a little bit earlier today about the CARES Act that was signed into law earlier this spring, and it was specifically to, to funds to be used to prevent, prepare for, and respond to the COVID-19 situation. So under the CARES Act, the WDE applied for participation in the Education Stabilization Fund Program titled the Elementary and Secondary School Emergency Relief or ESSER Fund. And we did receive approval for our grant application on May 28th. Um, these funds are to be provided to districts in our state to provide emergency relief to address the impact of COVID-19. Um, and that can be uh, the impact that it has had or continues to have on our students and our schools. So Wyoming received a federal grant award um, that identified just over $29 million for distribution to local school districts. Their portion or allocation was based on a funding formula um, that matched their fiscal year 2019 Title I Part A allocation. So since the opening of the district ESSER grant application on June 24, 31 districts have submitted applications with 29 of those being approved. And then um, uh, recently, uh, my last check yesterday afternoon, we've um, districts have been able to draw down just under $400,000 that have been paid out. So we yeah, still that have- seems like quite a low number out of 29 million. What am I missing? So um, Chairman Co, I think that that is kind of a low number. Uh, what we found was that um, several of our districts were early to submit their applications to have access to this funding. And then as some of the other uh, CARES funds became available, um, I think they, they kind of tapped the brakes just a little bit. Um, some districts then um, submitted amendments to their applications so that they could really take um, some time to look at the different funding sources that were available and what the specific parameters of each funding source was so that they could, I think, most um, thoughtfully use their funds. Um, now, they, the nearly 400,000 that's been paid out may not be a complete reflection either of um, the use of those funds. So we may have districts that have entered into um, purchases or uses for those funds, but we pay those you know, on the end. So as they are paying their vendor or they're ready to pay, then they draw the money down and, and send that, that bill out the door. So um, it's likely that um, those funds are being used at a higher level, just not billed out yet. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Senator Rafa's. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Uh, along those lines, I'm really concerned that about 1% of the funds have been distributed. Um, 31 applications have been submitted and 29 applications have been approved. What's the dollar value for the approvals? In, in other words, what is sort of the encumbered distribution to the districts that they know they can spend? Uh, Mr. Chairman and, and uh, Senator Rothfuss, um, I think I understand your question. So once the um, application is approved, their, um, their funds are fully available. Their entire amount is available to them. Mr. Chairman, what, what's the entire amount that has been obligated so far? I, uh, Mr. Chairman, I would have to go total that up. I didn't pull that number. I'm sorry. Okay, and follow up, Mr. Chairman. Um, oh, go ahead. Tell me about the other districts, the other 17 school districts, and why we don't have applications from, from them yet. I mean, th these funds were known of basically March 27th and uh, received approval on May 28th. My understanding of the intent of a lot of these funds was to prepare for school. 
effectively and make sure that things were safe and that our students could be appropriately educated as we came back to school. So I'm, I'm concerned that we don't even have all of the applications in yet. And we don't know how much of the funding's obligated. We've only paid out 400,000. So, I mean, is there more information that I don't see here that, that can give me a little bit more confidence that these funds are being distributed in a way that is first of all, consistent with their intent. And second of all, uh, is, is protecting the safety of, of the kids as we have all, but apparently one of our school districts going back to tier one. Chairman Co and yep. Senator Rothfuss, yes. Um, so I think what we're finding is there was um, maybe a not as smooth of a rollout with the different funding sources to support education. And I think that um, districts are grappling with the, the various funding sources that they have, like I, that I had mentioned before. Um, we do have only 16 um, remaining districts to apply. I know that the math would say 17, but we have one district that uh, was not eligible for a 2019 um, Title I allocation. So we just have 16 left. Uh, our team here at the WD has been in close uh, coordination with each of those districts as they uh, work through getting that application submitted. Um, we do have, I think it's, it's interesting to know that districts are grappling with a lot of funds. So many of the federal funds that would have sunsetted this um, summer, um, September 30th, uh, received an extension for a year, but their new grant funding cycle also opened up. And so they have a variety of um, funds that they're trying to utilize first in, first out and ensure that they're using those, I think, appropriately. Um, I think that we're seeing uh, what we've seen with the amendments that have come in um, are reflective of maybe the, um, the little bit of a bumpy or the, um, the way that the funds were rolled out. The ESSER funds were, were the first grant to open, but um, slide, the next slide will talk about some of the CARES funds. Uh, one of those um, funds was uh, part of the governor's 1.5 uh, billion, 1.25 billion that he identified for um, technology and distant learning support. So we had several districts that right away submitted their applications with an intent to use their funds for that allowable expense. And then when um, that work with WASA and, and um, the governor's office came to fruition and they realized that those uh, needs would be met with that other funding source, they then went in and changed. So I think there's a lot of um, just very intentional planning. Um, there are also, I think districts have the same team to um, complete those grant applications that are also completing their new consolidated grant application that is due by the end of this month. So I think there's a lot on their plates as they're working through. Okay, quick follow up, Mr. Chairman. Follow up. Uh, along those lines, did I understand you to say that the December 30th timeline does not apply to the ESSER grants? Uh, Senator Rothfuss, could you um, explain to me the December 30th timeline? Uh, most of the CARES Act funding goes away on December 30th, most of the stuff that I have worked with, uh, particularly on the Minerals Committee for Economic Development. Uh, but I know that the ESSER funds are, are dif differently legislated, I'll say. <laughs> and I don't know if they have the same expiration date. So maybe my, a part of my concern uh, might be remedied from when these funds are, are no longer on the table. Right, um, Chairman Coe and Senator Ruffus, that, that's exactly right. So the uh, Department of Education has a full year to get um, any of those funds um, distributed. Um, so that would bring us to May, uh, the end of May of 2021. School districts then have an additional full year to use those funds. Okay. Thank you, Mr. So Chairman. That's seven months. Sorry. That's very helpful. And, and so the final question, Mr. Chairman, th that I would ask is, do you have a projected schedule then for the rest of the districts to be getting their application in? Or, or you mentioned a unified. So now what I'm kind of assuming, maybe we'll get it to it some in the in the next slide, is is that we're trying to burn through the traditional CARES Act funds that have an expiration date of December 30th priority and then use the ESSER funds in a longer term concept so that we're, we're, we're making maximum use. Is that a fair assessment, Shelley? 
Yes, it is. Thank you. Kelly, I'm assuming that uh, you said there's one district not eligible. I'm assuming that's one of the Fremont County districts probably on the reservation. Um, actually, um, Chairman, it's uh, one of the Sheridan districts, Sheridan 3. Really? Yeah. Why Why would Arvada Claremont not be eligible? Um, Chairman, that's based on their um, poverty counts and um, they haven't been able, they haven't been eligible based on their counts. Um, it, it's a really, I, I wish that I could more articulately explain the formula, but for the past several years, they haven't been eligible. One of the things that um, we did take that into account as we worked collaboratively with the governor's office. I think that uh, Lachelle Brandt is up next on the agenda and we'll probably speak to that, but we did um, work to, uh, together to make a recommendation that uh, they receive uh, funding through the, the GEAR funds that Lachelle will speak to um, that would kind of compensate for that lack of um, ESSER um, allocation. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Please proceed. Mr. Chairman. Representative Connolly. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Shelley, just before we go on to the next slides, I just want to understand a little bit better about the $29.3 million that we've been allocated and spending 1% of it. And, you know, certainly one of my interests and concerns is that we spend that money. I mean, from mm -hmm. what I am hearing from our districts, they need it, they want it. And I'm, I'm wondering if we're going to have subsequent slides that give us a timeline, for example. Um, I want to know more about the one third of the districts that have not put in an application yet. And then the two thirds where it's possible, if not probable, that they could have more <coughs> of their, their requests and their needs. And also an assurance that there is kind of no desire to revert this money to the feds in a year. Kelly? Yep, Mr. Chairman and Representative Connolly. Um, I, I think that I can affirm everything that you said. There is absolutely no interest in uh, re reverting any of these funds. Um, I think <laughs> districts are being very intentional about their uses. And um, again, I think it goes very much goes back to the, the workload that our district partners are under right now, trying to get their regular consolidated grant application in because we don't have the flexibility to extend that deadline um, of having it uh, fully approved. So that has to be finished by September 30th. Um, they've entered into a new um, educational arena. And so I think most of the um, intentions of using that money right away were for technology and addressing the needs that um, came to the, that really came to the forefront during the um, closure last spring. Um, so many districts in, intended to use their funds for that, but then when the, the portion came from the governor's office to cover mm -hmm. those, many of those um, technology costs, uh, they've, they've shifted to using those. So those funds are being used. Um, I think now um, that summer's over, some of the funds were used by districts to address summer school and the gaps in learning that occurred. Um, some of those funds continue to be identified for um, extended day services for students um, to continue to, to fill that gap. So some after school tutoring, um, potentially some additional personnel to help during the school day itself to, to close that gap. We're also seeing a lot of uh, requests coming in um, that are taking care of, um, I think, sanitation um, supplies and equipment and things of that nature. So I think that um, they're, I think that knowing that they have the 27 uh, full months to spend it down, um, that has removed an urgency because they know that there won't be a loss in those funds. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Sean. Mm -hmm. any, any other questions at this time? Okay, please proceed. All right, so the next slide, um, well, it's titled the CARES PPE orders for district. Um, I do wanna just point out that our, our first uh, bullet there really does um, speak to the ongoing collaboration that the WD has engaged in with um, WASA and with the governor's office and then um, with a and I. So our first, the first thing that we did, I've, I've talked a, a bit extensively about is that the governor allocated 
uh, 42 and a half million dollars in um, funds to address the K-12 technology and distance learning needs that really um, districts recognized right off the bat when schools uh, closed. Uh, then there was an additional, just a little more than a million and a half that was identified to support the security and safety of their food service programs. As you all know, uh, food uh, was provided through our school districts for that closure period and, and then all through the summer. So um, the governor's office then followed up by allocating another uh, just over $7 million um, for districts that the WDE coordinated um, the purchase of the personal protective equipment. So um, WD worked with WASA and with ANI and collected information about what the district's needs were and then um, went to work coordinating the purchase of that PPE equipment through an on online retailer. So again, um, we're seeing a lot of the, the same types of um, materials um, needed, the sanitizer, disinfecting wipes, et cetera, those types of things. And um, those are being shipped directly to school districts um, from, the, from the vendor. The, um, we'll continue to work, work with that and, and utilize um, those funds as necessary. And to date, orders totaling um, just under three and a half million dollars have been processed. So um, does anyone have any questions about that? Any questions? Okay, please proceed. All right, I'll turn the time back over to Chief Shaner. Thank Nikki, you, Shelley. go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This fourth item talking about testing of staff and students. Um, several weeks ago, the Department of Health decided that um, they would work with some existing contracts they have with testing companies and try to negotiate uh, the ability to, to uh, allow districts to test staff. They call it surveillance testing, about 20% of their school district staff every two weeks um, with these contracts that our state was um, procuring with testing vendors. And um, where we're at right now, there's, there's two testing options. The first uh, that's currently available is through a company called Curative. Um, that one requires a little more administrative work on the school district in terms of having staff take those tests. Um, and then soon, the second option through a company called Vault uh, really is a more independent process with that staff member just being able to do it on their own, get the test results on their own. Uh, and so right now, we're working through whether districts want to uh, engage with Curative, stick with that, or uh, wait until... Uh, the vault option is available, uh, but the goal is um, an optional surveillance testing uh, at no cost to any school district who wishes to have uh, their staff participate. Uh, so the Department of Health is offering that currently. And then this last week, we received word from the White House. Superintendent Velo got a call from uh, the United States Deputy Secretary of Education uh, and then was looped into a call with um, the deputy director for White House uh, Logistics for COVID. And uh, they wanted to uh, announce, which President Trump subsequently announced as well, that uh, Abbott Labs has come up with these rapid tests for COVID. And uh, the federal government will have uh, 150 million here in the next week or two that they want to start distributing to states. And one of the the goals of that was to get it to school districts, again, to test staff and possibly even students if the school district wanted to uh, engage in student testing. And as uh, I understand of today, they have decided that uh, HHS, the federal agency, will now be working with governor's offices across states to try to disseminate these uh, tests uh, in a way that makes sense for each state. So we wanted to update you on that in terms of all the testing options that are currently available uh, and those that might be coming. And uh, with that, Mr. Chairman, that's all we have on our PowerPoint and, and happy to answer any questions related to any of those items. Senator Roethlis, questions of Dickey and uh, Shelley on the presentation. Go ahead, Senator Roethlis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, on the timeline for the vault testing, it, it looked like that wouldn't be available for six more weeks. Uh, what's the concern with the timeline there? Why is it taking so long? Who wants to answer that, Dickie or? Probably Dickie. 
There we go. Sorry. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Through you, Senator Rothfuss. My understanding is just that they were they're literally in the middle of negotiating that contract right now. So they, you know, the state process of contracts takes several weeks to get done. So as soon as that gets finalized, I uh, imagine that that option will be available. Mr. Chairman, could uh, Dicky, could you leverage the university's contract and and work through that on a temporary basis? Uh, it's possible. We can certainly reach out to them and and see. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, I'd, I'd ask, and, and we've got plenty of university here uh, to have that conversation, see if you can borrow our contract for a little while and uh, and maybe deploy those more quickly because I think that vault testing uh, is is a very effective system and it is a lot easier to use for the, the staff, uh, I think, to get deployed to districts. So if you'd make that connection and follow up, I'd appreciate it, Dickie. You bet. Greater questions of Dickie or Shelley? Representative Pete Perinen. Thank I don't you, know man. how to pronounce your name. It took me a couple of years, but I'm- You're doing good. good with it. You sound like a Finn. <laughs> um, yeah, Dickie Shaner, um, could you just comment? It may not be related to this, but I understand the USDA is now providing free lunches for all students under 18 now. Is that correct? Um, Representative Shelley, you want to answer that? Shelley oversees that program. Shelley, do you want to answer that? Yep, thank you, um, Chairman and Representative Piperinen. Um, the We did just receive notification earlier this week that the uh, national waivers that USDA had afforded through um, the summer based um, out of the, the summer food service program were extended through the calendar year, so through December, uh, the end of December. So those, um, those meals that have been utilized by family members for anyone under um, 18 and, and under will continue. Okay, any other questions to Dickie or Shelley? Any other questions? Seeing none. Okay, Dickie and Shelley, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, uh, members of the committee, it's my intention to take public comment after we go through all, all four of these bullet points. So the next bullet point is a general update from the governor's office related to K-12 and post-secondary education funding and disbursements. Michelle Brandt, welcome, Michelle. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Um, my name's Lachelle Brandt. I'm the policy advisor, senior policy advisor in Governor Gordon's office. And it's a privilege to be here today to provide you with an update on the CARES uh, Act spending plan. I have a brief presentation um, for you as you've already heard from the Department of Education and you will be hearing from higher education following my presentation. I believe Matt is going to share this presentation the screen, so um, yep, we've got it. Right, thank you. Sorry, I'm just getting my screen organized here. So as you are aware, um, the CARES Act provided $1.2 billion in relief funding to support the state's efforts um, to mitigate the impacts of COVID-19. The governor's office has allocated all of the $1.25 billion in the CARES Act funds across 10 categories. And as you can see, education resilience is 175 out of the $1.25 billion. Go to the next slide, please. There were essentially three timelines upon which the funds were distributed. 797 million out of the 850 million available has been dis dispersed thus far and the remaining 400 million, as you can see, will be dispersed after September 15th. The next slide shows a breakdown of the disbursements within each of the 10 categories I mentioned. And so far, 150 of the 175 million approved for education has been dispersed. The visual representation on this slide displays the percentage of funds by category. As you will notice, education is the second largest allocation receiving 18% of the total 1.25 billion available. 
And all of this information I just shared with you is available on the Wyoming Sense website, and it's updated as these funds are distributed. The 150 million that has been allocated so far is broken down into three categories. The University of Wyoming has received a total of 46.5, 26.5 million for reopening the university, 20 million for the housing and meals for students in the CARES, Wyoming CARES College funds. An additional to 5 million has been set aside if the 20 million um, is totally expended. Moving to the community colleges, they have received 52.4 million, including 24.9 for reopening, uh, 20 million for student housing and meals with the additional five set aside, and then 7.5 million for adult student grants, which the university will share a portion of to assist adult students. And then lastly, K-12 education has received 56, or sorry, 51.6 million. 1.7 for summer food support, 42 million for technology and connectivity, and 7.3 for PPE. In addition to the 1.25 billion, Wyoming received additional funds for education in three buckets. The governor's office received 4.7 million to provide emergency assistance to local education agencies higher education and other education related entities. And those funds are referred to as the GEAR funds or the Governor's Education Emergency Relief Fund. The next pot of money you heard about earlier is referred to as the Elementary and Secondary School Emergency Relief Funds or the ESSER funds. And those were distributed directly to the Wyoming Department of Education um, and based on Title I allocations. The last pot of money is referred to the Higher Education Emergency Relief Funds or HER funds and 13.5 million was distributed directly to higher education. Half of those funds were awarded to students and half of those funds went directly to the institutions. And I know that higher education will provide more details on those funds in just a little bit. The governor's office received, as I said, the 4.7 million in discretionary funds to allocate based on the governor's evaluation of the greatest educational needs in Wyoming related to COVID-19. And in order to evaluate the greatest needs, the governor's office requested and received proposals for the use of 50% of these GEAR funds from school districts, higher education, early childhood education, and other education entities. The proposals that were submitted were reviewed by the Governor's COVID Education Task Force, as you heard um, Mr. Shainer say, was led by the Superintendent of Public Instruction. And those recommendations then from the task force went to the Governor for approval. The greatest needs identified P20 were for students transitioning from pre-K to K, K-12 to higher education, and then adults to workforce. In order to avoid duplication of funding, as you heard earlier, um, that, that was a concern. So 50% of the remaining funds have been reserved until all of the CARES funds have been expended and we can determine the greatest education needs that exist. The funds were awarded to essentially four agencies based on the total funds available to the request with each applicant receiving 24% 20 of their total request in this first round. The first agency you will note is the Department of Education, which received 243,000 and the Elbogen Foundation donated an additional 11 million, or sorry, 11,000 for a total of 250,000. DFS contracted with Wyoming Kids First to distribute the funds through a grant process to early childhood providers and school districts to meet the needs for children entering early childhood or kindergarten programs. A total of 495,000 was requested, so we were able to fund 51% of the applications received. Eight school districts and two private providers were awarded those funds. The second agency to receive funds was the Department of Education, and I will echo what Dickie Shainer express the partnership between the Wyoming Department of Education and the governor's office has been critical to uh, distribute these funds and 
to answer Senator Rossfitt's remarks about the delay, I have to say that some of the delay, unfortunately, the governor's office isn't accustomed to receiving uh, federal funds and setting up some of the processes through the federal government did take more time than anticipated. The department received a total of 765,000 that will flow to the local education agencies and will be allocated to each district. Um, each district will receive a minimum of 5,000 and then the remaining funds will be based on their ADM calculations. To date, the WD has approved 18 applications for the funds. One is under review and 29 have not submitted an application. As Shelly Hamill expressed, an additional 38,000 was allocated to Sheridan County School District number three, as they were the only school district that did not receive the ESSER funding as they were not Title I eligible. The third agency to receive funds was the Wyoming College Commission. The seven colleges received a million 73,000 to ensure teachers can continue to teach and students can continue to learn. They also received flow through funds um, for the Carbon County Higher Education Center in the amount of 11,000 to assist students to complete welding and CNA programs that were disrupted due to COVID-19. Additional funds were given to the commission for adult education providers that sit at the seven community colleges, one BOCES, and uh, one Department of Corrections facility. Those funds will be targeted for the equipment, supplies, professional development, and increased instructional hours needed to achieve both federal and state goals for adult education. Next, the Wyoming Department of Health uh, received flow through funds that will go to the Wyoming Behavioral Institute in the amount of 82,500 for improved technology and content learning management systems. And lastly, the Department of Workforce Services received 64,841 to partner with the Array School of Technology and Design to assist with an apprenticeship program for students whose program was disrupt disrupted due to COVID-19 and to offer some additional hands-on experience necessary before graduation. These students will be assisting the Wyoming Technology Coronavirus Coalition or WTCC that was recently formed to work on technology solutions for fighting COVID-19. The students will be assigned to companies that have suffered hardships to provide them an increased workforce without burdening them with hope that they will recover enough to employ the students when the apprenticeships end. There are five companies they will be assigned to which include Visit Cheyenne, which that project is aug aug augmented reality and virtual reality applications to increase tourism. Flow State Solutions, that will be to develop the technology to use artificial intelligence to detect oil leaks. The Wyoming Association of Mental Health and Substance Abuse mm. um, to develop an app for remote patient monitoring. Du Bois's economic development arm drive, and lastly, the Arapaho Nation um, to develop an application for transferring content to a cloud-based system to preserve the Arapaho language. Um, an internship through workforce services will cover the majority of the wages and the grant will cover the remaining gap. And with that, Mr. Chairman, that concludes my presentation and I would stand for any questions. Okay, questions of Michelle? Are there any questions? Seeing no questions, Lachelle, thank you very much. I appreciate thank your you. presentation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Anybody on the committee have a problem if we get done early? <laughs> okay, next item. Updates from the university. I see, I see there's Tara Evans. I see President Seidel. We've got, uh, President Seidel, Tammy Benham, Deal, Kimberly Ches Chesmut, and Tara Evans, please proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm Ed Seidel. I'm the new president of the University of Wyoming, and I'm uh, pleased to report to you today. I I'm also honored to be in this new role for me, and uh, I've gotten to know a few of you, but I look forward to getting to know you 
much better in the coming months. I, I think before I, I dive in, I wanted to just do a little further introduction for, to my team here. So as you, uh, as you uh, announced a little bit, um, we have Vice Provost uh, Tammy Benham Deal here. We have uh, General Counsel Tara Evans. We have the Director for Government Affairs, um, Alex Keene. We have Vice President for Student Affairs, um, Kim Chestnut, and we have Professor Brant Shoemaker, who will, I think, all help us make this presentation to you today. Can we have the first slide uh, from Matt, please? Thanks. So before I dive into this, I, I wanted to make a couple of remarks generally about my view of the future of the university. I really wish that that could be the topic right now. I know we're going to report on COVID-19, but I just wanted to take a minute to tell you how excited I am about taking the long view of the university and the state and the things we'll be able to do. And I'm very bullish on what we'll be able to do in the next years. And I'm, I'm very excited about it. First of all, I think the university will show its value to the state as we think about not only educating the workforce uh, in collaboration with the community colleges and communities across the state and businesses, but also think about laying the foundation for economic development for the future of the state. So my, my, in my former role, I was the vice president for economic development at the University of Illinois. And I spent a lot of time thinking about how to sharpen the value proposition of the university to bring back as much value as possible to the state. And learning some lessons from that, I, I intend to do the same thing here. Another point I wanted to make is we've begun to really already plan for the future of the university. And we are thinking a lot about how to build it as the best in class uh, land grant university for the 21st century that is true to the roots of Wyoming. And there's a lot packed in there. I won't go into all of that right now, but there are a few things that I think you can, you can hear in that. First of all, that we take the land grant mission really seriously. That is how we bring back value to the state, whether it's educating the workforce or working on developing the, laying the foundation for the future economy of the state. That's very important for us while also uh, supporting the existing economy market sectors. And so uh, I, one day I hope to be able to tell you all about what we're thinking about for that. 21st century means that we are really thinking a lot about future technologies. You heard Lachelle talk about things like artificial intelligence and virtual reality and augmented reality and, and such things. Those will be very important and you'll see we'll be growing our portfolio in areas like that over time and looking to uh, also focus a lot on entrepreneurship going forward to help uh, people, students and faculty and, and people we work with, particularly at the community colleges, uh, trying to collectively develop hubs of innovation around the, the community colleges and communities across the state uh, for helping to support the new economy. So that's really important to us, but I'll, I'll shift gears and, and stay tuned for a longer report on that. And I'll talk about uh, COVID-19. And I want to also say we're taking the long view on COVID-19 preparations and, and the, the, uh, the way we are prepared for um, the, the future of this semester. So as you have probably all heard, we've just gone into a pause uh, that we'll describe what that means in a minute. But that is because we are very well prepared for uh, the future of this semester so that we can remain open. And that is the main message I want to tell you is that we are we have put in many science-based programs and potential interventions will be very nimble going forward as we think about uh, assessing the situation when we see how many cases we have, when we see how they're being spread, and, and we'll have a report from Brandt a little bit later on that. So overall, I'm, I'm very proud of the leadership we've been providing at the statewide level in, in the looking at the ways we can uh, have the best chance of staying open. And I would say many universities, particularly in the Mountain West and others, have been talking talking to us about how, how it is that we're standing up our testing programs and how important that is. And so we've been consulting a lot with them. And we put in plans and taken decisions that are aimed at keeping the university open. And that is very important for us so that we can provide the best education for our students. If you look at the national landscape in contrast, you, you may see um, many universities actually started from the very beginning to plan to be online. And so they, they had planned already for months to do that and they are online fully. Uh, other universities in the last few weeks 
have had to react to the situation they find themselves in without breaks and they've gone online 100% actually. So we're not doing this. We're, we're, uh, we have plans that we, we hope will allow us to stay open and uh, we're working very hard to make sure that we can trace down any of the infections that we found in, in the last few days in particular. Hundreds of universities across the, the country are scrambling right now to stand up testing programs. And uh, I think in contrast, you'll see we have very strong plans in place so we're, we can be nimble and we can take actions to help keep us open. So um, we're currently in a pause and uh, uh, you will hear more about this going forward. But what that means is we detected a number of cases in the last days. And as according to our plan that was approved by the Board of Trustees, we, it, when we hit certain thresholds, we go into a pause, which means we continue classes, people stay on campus, but we go into precautionary mode so that we can limit the spread of infections and try to trace down where they've come from and isolate students who may have been exposed so that we can then uh, get back to a state where we're actually open. And so we'll make a decision later next week by Wednesday uh, and Thursday would be the first day that we would be able to, to go back into a, a, an open mode that is in terms of being uh, having in-person classes. So we'll, we'll hear about more about that in a minute. But, but let me tell you about this phased opening plan. So again, about uh, a month ago, maybe three or four weeks ago now, uh, we were in a situation where we had been planning to open as scheduled uh, on August the 24th, uh, but we realized that we were not able to get all of the testing equipment in place that we needed in order to test everyone on campus. And the best recommendations, according to the science and the epidemiologists that have been studying this are that you should test everyone on the campus one or two times per week that's thousands of tests per day. Uh, and so uh, we, we are having trouble with the supply chain. We've ordered the equipment month, uh, weeks and weeks ago, but it's slow to be delivered. So we decided to then go into a phased in approach where every student who's on campus as of August 24th would be a, a welcome to stay on campus. Our classes, except in a couple of very small cases were are online, but students are actually in the, the dormitories and in a, a university housing. Uh, but, but then uh, our staff would, re would work remotely where possible. Uh, we also have implemented a, what we call a bridge testing program that you'll hear more about in, the, in a, a few minutes, but it's a, pr a program where students are tested uh, and, and so are staff and faculty roughly once per week as we go forward, uh, in, but with a limited um, number of people on the campus. Um, starting uh, next week, we will go into phase two where more students will be welcome back to the campus, including pr primarily uh, freshmen and first year students. Uh, the bridge testing program will continue. And then finally by phase three, which is September the 28th, our plans are to have everyone fully back on campus and we'll have the, the full semester up and running, assuming we uh, are able to take interventions that bring us out of the pause that we're currently in. So at that time, we would have what we call the surveillance testing program, where we're able to test everyone, uh, every student uh, 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 roughly twice per week, and every staff and faculty member roughly once per week, according to the best recommendations of the science and the epidemiologist. That would allow us to catch infections and stop them before they spread. And then finally, in phase four, we would have the situation basically going into Thanksgiving where students would depart campus, but we really didn't want people to go home and then catch coronavirus and bring it back to the campus. And so we decided to just finish the semester online after Thanksgiving. So let me turn to the next slide, please. And I believe I'll turn it over to Tammy Benham Deal to take us from here. Yes, thank, thank you, Mr. President, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, we began planning for our fall return about the same time we were graduating uh, our seniors last May, albeit a uh, virtual graduation. And in our original plan, we had five principles that the plan was grounded in. And, and one of those principles was to keep the virus out to the extent possible. And as a consequence of that principle, we uh, initiated a pre-return uh, testing program that all students and all employees uh, would complete. You've heard earlier about the vault test. That is the test that we utilized for that pre-return plan. In addition to the testing, we also required uh, online training for both our employees and our students. Now, our fall plan hinges in th on, on three critical areas. One is our ability to test. One is uh, our ability to rapidly uh, conduct contact tracing. 
And the third area is our ability to quarantine and isolate those who are ill or who have been uh, exposed. And we've been uh, really focusing on creating an environment that helps us to achieve those uh, key, uh, key elements. Now, uh, you'll see on the slide um, uh, that we have here, uh, once our students and our, our, our full employees are uh, back on campus, uh, we are depending on uh, them to uh, demonstrate personal responsibility uh, that we, each of us, uh, have to, to, to demonstrate in order to help us contain the spread of the virus on campus. You can see some of the prevention measures that we are implementing or have already been implementing in phase one and will continue to throughout the rest of the phases in our fall semester. Uh, part of uh, the uh, prevention uh, uh, measures we're taking is we're asking all of our employees and our students to conduct daily temperature uh, and symptom checks. They do that with something called the COVID pass tool. It's sometimes called an app, but it's not really an app. It's actually a mobile uh, friendly uh, website. Uh, we are requiring uh, all to wear face coverings as well as to uh, comply with uh, social distancing requirements. We have adjusted our classroom spaces uh, to ensure that those social distan distance requirements are uh, uh, met. Um, and, and I think I would tell you that uh, we do expect our, our community, our university community, both employees and, and students to comply with public health policy. We're working very actively to encourage and, and to enable this. One great example is a, a new first year course that President Seidel uh, recommended a number of weeks ago. It's a one credit hour to tuition free uh, course that our students can take. It's called Build the Future. We believe that our students are critical uh, to uh, not only the future of our fall semester, but uh, the future of our university going forward. We already have 72 students enrolled in this course. That's over 1,000 uh, hours available in service learning projects, which can span from assisting with contact tracing and, and assisting in our, our, our testing program to other, uh, other opportunities that our, our, our students have on campus for the fall semester. If we can go to the next slide, uh, let me just very briefly uh, report to you that we are um, making every effort using lots of different media and, and different approaches to communicate uh, what is going on at the university. You can see some examples of uh, our efforts to, to do those communications. We've held a number of town halls. Our more recent one was with the, the city of Laramie. Uh, our mayor was there, our, public, our county public health officer was there, trustee uh, Brown was there. And so uh, we are trying to reach out in the form of town halls as well as information sessions. We've done uh, the Office of Academic Affairs as well as our Student Affairs and our Student Success Center. They've done a number of YouTube videos and others uh, with a variety of audiences targeted uh, for those messages. We have uh, distributed all sorts of, of handouts where we have a presence on social media. Uh, we're doing a lot of different announcements. And as uh, President Seidel mentioned, with regard to the pause that we're in, we are providing daily reports uh, on our status in addition to our COVID website that uh, uh, maintains a, a daily updated uh, dashboard. Um, we have a COVID hub that um, receives both telephone calls as well as email communications. They receive thousands of emails and we have uh, stood up uh, a team that is responding to those inquiries as quickly as we can. So that gives you just a general view uh, of the way we are communicating. And I think as we go to the next slide, I will pass it off to um, uh, uh, Dr. Shoemaker to talk to you just a little bit about our, our testing programs. Thank you, Tammy, Mr. Chairman. Um, so uh, my name is Brant Shoemaker. I'm an epidemiologist by training, associate professor in the Department of Veterinary Sciences at the University of Wyoming. 
Um, the, our goal with the bridge and surveillance testing programs, which have been established, is to provide an opportunity for the university to remain open this fall semester. And that's our, our primary objective. Um, in order to do that, we need to be able to find any sort of meaningful COVID-19 outbreak and contain it quickly. And so uh, because we are not able to have our, our kind of gold standard surveillance testing program up and running at the beginning of the semester, we, we started with a bridge testing program uh, from the same manufacturer as our pre-return testing. So that's Vault that you've heard described previously. And that's gonna be conducted um, through the first five weeks of the semester, including this period of, of pause, which we'll get into a little bit of specifics. The goal of that is to test um, all individuals as part of this phased return once weekly during the course of the first five weeks. So for phase one and two that were described previously by President Seidel. It's a, a saliva-based polymerase chain reaction assay that detects the viral RNA in the sample. And um, again, we are applying this to all individuals on campus who cannot socially distance. Our, our gold standard that we'd like to get started is, is a surveillance test uh, developed uh, by the uh, University uh, of Illinois, and, and we've taken a lot of their notes and, and applied it into our system as well. Um, and again, this is going to be conducted uh, on all students twice weekly and all staff and faculty once weekly. Once we get our uh, uh, machinery in place to conduct that volume of testing, which requires some robotics, et cetera, that we've just not been able to get in-house up to this point. Um, but the whole point of this uh, program is to be aggressively testing our population. And the best science that we have available tells us that we need to find any sort of meaningful infectivity on campus and remove eight, about 80% in order to not have a, a major outbreak on our hands. So that's our goal with these um, two limbs of our testing program. Perhaps I'll, I'll stop there if it won't disrupt our flow too much and ask if there's any questions about our testing program before we kind of get into some of what we've seen with our um, current cases. Any questions to Brant? Any questions? Mr. Chairman? Let's see, who is that? You got enough people on your Representative Brown. Oh, Representative Brown down there. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, just a quick question for you. How are you planning on doing this? Is this going to be like a, a students come voluntarily walk in to a couple of different clinics throughout the, the uh, campus? Is this going to be, you know, one clinic or, you know, one area that they're, they're going to be sitting there waiting for hours? Can you kind of give me an idea of what this testing is going to look like? Absolutely, Mr. Chairman, Representative Brown. Um, this is uh, right now is being conducted in one location, but we're using a, a Microsoft Bookings app that is allowing us to schedule appointments, uh, 10 minute appointments and have individuals arrive. I did my test on Tuesday. Uh, there was no wait. I was able to be seen right away. Uh, the stations are in uh, right now are in the basement of our uh, Wyoming Union. And um, you're six feet apart with, uh, you know, socially distanced staff members to help you um, in and out of there in, in 10 minutes. And so it worked out really slick. The volume of saliva required for the vault test is significantly more than what would be required for the surveillance test. So we actually only estimate individuals having to be in a, in a sampling location, which would be actually at multiple locations across campus for the, the sampling uh, surveillance testing. Uh, but we only estimate individuals having to be there for three to five minutes max. So it, it's, it's a really um, actually impressive effort that uh, our Dean of Health Sciences, David Jones has been leading and, and they're doing a great job on keeping no real lines in place and getting this volume of sampling done. One last follow-up, Mr. Chairman, if I may. Oh, go ahead. It, this is a requirement uh, for all students as well. Is that correct? Or is this a, uh, we'll do it if you're interested? Uh, Mr. Chairman, Representative Brown, th this is actually something that we are requiring of um, individuals that are on campus during this time for both staff, faculty, and students in order to keep us open. 
Other questions? Okay, seeing none, thank you, Brent. Next on the UW agenda. Do we have anybody else, Tara Evans or anybody? We have a few more slides. I have a few more slides. Okay, go ahead. Okay, so um, prior to um, the semester beginning, a, a large collaborative team of individuals, um, including UW Board of Trustee member John McKinley, State Health Officer Alexia Harris, Ivinson Memorial Hospital CEO Doug Faust, Albany County Health Officer Gene Elias, Albany County School District Number One Superintendent Jubal Yenny, as well as many others uh, from among the university campus, uh, participated in a process to identify uh, items to monitor to detect if we had any sort of a problem going on again, so that we can adapt and react quickly in order to maintain our continuity of operations at the university and stay open for our semester. When we went to a phased approach, when we learned that we weren't able to do a surveillance testing, we, we created two sets of triggers, which would allow for us to have an automatic pause of operations and ultimately uh, evaluate information determine whether we have a, a meaningful problem that we've been able to contain or whether we have some sort of a, a crisis that we just have rampant cases out of control. In, in the current situation we'll, we'll talk about, we think it's probably that we have relatively good containment around the situation, but we have had a number of cases. Basically what's going on right now is that we have taken an automatic pause uh, because we have seen over uh, the course of, of the last few days, a, a number of cases, and I'll get into that in the next slide. But the, the point of the pause is to shift to remote work for employees, online courses, and then requiring students to, uh, where possible, shelter in residence halls and residences uh, in the event that we have these sorts of situations occurring. Now, the pause doesn't mean that individuals can't go outside, uh, that they can't attend uh, religious services or anything like that. So we're still allowing for individuals to go to work, to conduct business, to go outside uh, individual outdoor activities, um, seek you know, medical care and testing and go to religious services. It just means that we are promoting the idea that we've got a situation on our hands. We need to be able to uh, assess the situation, conduct really rigorous data analysis uh, each day with a large group of individuals and assess what's going on and make sure we have the situation under control. Uh, a, a number of different triggers have been identified for both the phased approach as well as the bridge or the final surveillance testing plan. The, the one I'll point out because it's the one that we've actually hit is that uh, if we have testing that's occurring by individuals outside of the bridge testing or the surveillance testing, but individuals that aren't feeling well and coming to student health services or primary care practices throughout Albany County um, to be tested. And uh, we're finding that a number of those individuals are positive. If we start seeing in a single day, five or more of those individuals that are sick and testing positive, that we've hit an automatic pause. The reason we, we feel that's important is that if we have uh, symptomatic individuals that are testing positive, they likely represent the tip of an iceberg of an outbreak. Because with this age bracket, we expect that many more individuals would be asymptomatic and, and still able to transmit the virus, but we're only finding the symptomatic individuals during this period of time. Um, again, there you, we have a really detailed triggers document that we can share and it's available on our website. And I'd like to just stop there and see if any uh, anybody has any questions about this slide before I move on. Okay, any questions? Any questions? Okay, please proceed, Brent. Thank you, please next slide. So over the last weekend, um, we had reports of multiple large uh, off-campus gatherings of students uh, it resulted in many contacts uh, and, and a lot of cases associated with these outbreaks. Um, so during this period of time, um, we've had to uh, ha have over 70 uh, individuals 
in quarantine or isolation. Um, we currently have 30 active cases, greater than 50% of those were symptomatic. And that in court includes 93 cumulative cases since the tracking began. Basically what, what has gone on is we think that uh, an individual wasn't feeling well, uh, participated in, in multiple off-campus parties and uh, had so many contacts that we are, we were seeing that we almost hit a trigger Monday and Tuesday in terms of the number of sick people coming into student health services. And then yesterday we had reports of seven new symptomatic cases on the University of Wyoming campus. So that initiated our pause and, and we went into that operation. Um, important thing is that cumulatively over the last three days, we've had 15 cases. Um, we're, we're currently testing a lot and I've heard of at least one more case today. We'll, we'll know a lot more when uh, Student Health Services closes uh, their doors for testing at 432. Any other questions for me? Any other questions for Brant? Any questions? Okay, I believe I turn it over to Vice Provost Ben Ooh. Taylor. Mr. Chairman, Ooh. Senator Hutchings is well, uh, Senator Hutchings. trying to get some attention there. <laughs> that, that, thank you, uh, Senator Roffus. Uh, Mr. Uh, thank you also, Mr. Chairman. This question is for Brandt. Uh, you, you mentioned a few activities where you're seeing uh, the students have engaged in and there's a rise in um, symptomatic COVID cases. Um, do you... Are you keeping track of where and what these activities are um, so you will know exactly where to say we don't want the students going? Because you mentioned parties and then a little further up, you mentioned uh, that religious activities are still going on at the school, at the university. Uh, have you noticed any cases uh, while people are engaging in religious activities. Mr. Chairman, Senator Hutchings. Um, so we are, um, we are not able to uh, attend all of the parties in Laramie uh, based on, <laughs> but certainly in terms of what we've been able to determine up to this point, uh, the, the vast preponderance of these cases are associated with the group of individuals that participated in these parties over the last weekend. Um, we are unaware of any cases associated with religious gatherings, um, but we do, you know, go through a pretty extensive contact tracing process to identify locations of where cases have been, as well as lists of names of first degree contacts. So individuals that had had a prolonged exposure to any of our cases. To this point, uh, one thing that gives us encouraging news is that we, we feel that all of these cases in general are tied to these large campus gatherings. And we've been able to quarantine or isolate the individuals associated with those. Um, I think moving forward, a lot of our success and ability to reopen next week will depend on individual behavior over the Labor Day weekend and whether we've been able to educate and, and the, have the students actually listening to the message of this is a serious disease and we need to contain it over the weekend. Great, thank you, Grant. Brent, Brent. Representative Brown, then I'll go to Representative Conley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So Brent, I guess this is probably for you just based off of everything else that's going on. I really didn't know where to ask this and who to ask it to. Um, so anybody, please feel free to chime in here. Is there any reason why a student with um, any symptoms or any question at all that uh, wished to be tested would not have been able to be tested by the university or would have been turned away um, for any reason at all. And the reason I ask this is I, I'm trying to get to the bottom of a, of a particular situation that I've become aware of where a student had not paid a $395 uh, fee to the university. And when that fee was not paid, um, the student was turned away and was told you cannot be tested. And so I, I'm getting one side of the story. So trust me, I, I'm completely understanding of that. I'm just trying to maybe get another reasoning as to why that may have happened or if there is um, 
if there's reasoning behind why we wouldn't why we would not be testing uh, students. Uh, right. Vice President Chestnut looks like she's ready to answer that question. Sure. So, Representative Brown, Mr. Chairman, I can offer a little clarity on that. So, each semester, students have essentially a portfolio of fees, some of which are elective and some of which are required. What I can tell you is this semester, we had more students who are all online than ever before. Students who are all online are not required to pay the consolidated student fee, which incorporates coverage at student health services. And so usually our students who live on campus and have at least one in-person course would automatically have that part of their services for the semester. So for students who arrive now at Student Health who may not have paid that fee, will be kind of checked in and will say, oh, we see that you're not currently enrolled in the Consolidated Student Fee Program. Everybody's eligible for that. You can do so immediately if you'd like. And then the student has the option if they wanna do that. So in short, yes, a student could have been turned away, but not without options. We would have said, would you like to consider joining and, and having this care provided ongoing? If you, if you don't, we can absolutely refer you to a community partner. Um, if you have a, if you wanna do a fee payment plan, we can arrange a payment plan. But in short, there, there is a cost associated with care and that's covered by that fee. So does that help answer that Representative Brown? It certainly does, thank you. Uh, and Mr. Chairman, if I can have a follow-up on that. Follow-up. I, I would like to question, I guess, maybe a little bit here. I, I'm, I, I understand the necessity and there is absolutely a cost to care. However, I'm also aware that the legislature as well as the governor's office has appropriated millions of dollars to the university for COVID related expenses. And I'll be honest with you, and, and I'm, I'm looking here directly at the, at the president and everybody else that's associated with the university. I'm, I'm frankly appalled um, that we have sent millions of dollars to the university and we have students that are being sent away for not being able to be tested because of a $395 assessment fee. Now I can understand all the other associated health issues uh, that go along with this, but when we have sent COVID money over to the university, um, I would expect that students would be able to be tested. Uh, it, you're requiring it to be a test to be on campus. And now we're telling them, if you don't pay this fee, you're not going to be able to get this. Um, I, I'm, I'm a little troubled and I'm, I'm, I'm really hoping that maybe I understand where you're coming from, that there's a, a necessity of charging for care, but when it comes to COVID, there has been plenty of money sent over there to make sure that the uh, reduced amount of students over there can be taken care of. And I'll offer first and then others can. So Representative Brown, Mr. Chairman, I really appreciate you bringing this to our attention and have no hesitation in pursuing, looking into that. I will tell you, it is a rare occasion and maybe to your point, today is my first day, not your, not your commentary today, but this morning is the first day I have heard that we haven't been able to provide care for a student. Um, and so I'm, I'm also invested in ensuring that we provide care comprehensively. And I think I care about that, whether we had CARES funds or not, right? We, we work really hard to ensure that we take care of our population. And so I promise that I can further investigate and work with our team accordingly to do so. And I see that President Seidel also wanted to offer regards. President, President Seidel, go ahead. Thank you. So I also, I just learned about this literally about an hour ago that, about this one case. And uh, we don't think that this was handled it the best way. And so we will make sure that this isn't an issue going forward. So I just, I promise you that. I appreciate it, thank you. Senator Roffus. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the president just uh, addressed my concern. Okay, please proceed. Um, I'm not sure what's up next, but uh, please proceed. The so University we, of Wyoming. Yeah, we can go to the next slide. I just was going to share a little bit more about what a pause looks like. So 
So this is just a brief review for the group and certainly things that we have communicated to our campus community. But the ultimate message, and a lot of this goes to our students, is we're really taking an opportunity to evaluate the circumstances and intend for a return to our phased approach to being on campus. And so really wanting to make that clear to our students and invite them to share in that responsibility with us. So all courses during this time are taught online and we're really limiting those who are on campus to folks who we've identified as critical pause personnel. So that's a lot of our operations and administration team, certainly our residence life and dining team, student health continues to be available and some of our technology support resources. And so when we have students who might be kind of in this modified space, we are working really hard to help ensure that they know most of everything is still available. You can't do it in person, but it's still there. And so ensuring that they can connect to those resources virtually. We have had um, many conversations about the student fees that exist across the semester. So we just had a brief conversation about one, but there are multiple. And so we've actually written a proposal that will be shared with our board of trustees at their meeting later this month. I would offer that athletics seems to be one of the points of interest when it comes to fees. And knowing that our fall sports had to be notably abbreviated, that would be the primary fee that would be reduced. And so for reference, that's usually $123.50 a semester. And athletics has proposed a reduction of 66%. So wanting to really attend to students' concerns about, am I getting what I'm paying for? Um, and so that whole fee structure is being evaluated and reviewed later this month. And then we're also really taking our time in connecting with students around withdrawal. So what we are finding is most of the time when a student calls, um, perhaps frustrated about the circumstances, if we take the time to have the conversation and say, what do you need? What are you concerned about? How can we help? The resolution often is that they want to stay and they just need some clarification. However, if it turns out that this is not the time for them to be with us, that is also an option and we will assist them through a pretty flexible and streamlined withdrawal process if that's what's most appropriate. And then this last piece is a little bit about what Grant had shared just a couple minutes ago, but we appreciate that a pause is not an order for quarantine, right? It's guidance, but it's not medically mandated. And so we still want our students to participate in the testing program. We understand if they need to go and buy food or pick up medication. Many of our students are employed and so they'll continue to work during the pause period and attend other um, engagements that, that feel like they align with where we're at. So um, religious services or other small groups. We've guided students to please keep their group size to about two to three individuals. So that's a little bit about the pause and then Alex wanted to share a little bit about funding. So I'll pass it over to him. Mr. Chairman. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, excuse okay. me, Representative Connolly, go ahead, question. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Before we kind of move on to the money, um, Dr. Cheston, I've got a couple of questions about the pause and actually the, the very particular timing of it right now. The first slide indicated that there are 1,500 students on campus a week or two ago, 3,500 expected Monday. So we are right now in that period of time where there's an expectation of 2,000 more students coming to Laramie and UW. And I'm curious what that means during a pause. Will there be kind of residence halls opening? Um, lots and lots of activity tends to happen around Laramie when students move into the dorms. And that's what the expectation is for this weekend with freshmen. Is that being paused as well? So Representative Connolly, Mr. Chairman, what we have done is modified that move in plan. So prior to the pause on this coming Saturday and Sunday, approximately a thousand more students were scheduled with a specific day and time for move in. And we reached out to all of those students who are scheduled to move in and asked them to reevaluate their plan. So if they have the flexibility to move in post the pause, 
that's our recommendation and our request. For those who are already in transit or don't have an alternate housing location, we will allow to move in as scheduled. So to your point, in service of reducing the volume and trying to help keep the interactions as limited as possible, we have really engaged our move-in community, asking them to, to really wait until approximately another week. We will um, prorate their room so they don't pay for a week that they haven't been with us. And I would tell you by and large, most families feel agreeable to that type of arrangement and have been supportive of that option. All right, thank you, Mr. Chairman, one more. And, one and more, go ahead. Thank you. And that's about access to needed services. And the one in particular that I'm thinking of had is just computers. Um, it seems to me that a lot of our students don't have their own laptops. I mean, they have their own phones. We know that for sure. But the ability to do kind of university level work only using a phone um, could be a problem for lots of students. And so I'm curious about the access to kind of needed technology in order to do the coursework that we're expecting of them. Because the expectation is that they're doing the coursework, but there also is kind of closed libraries, closed unions. My guess is that there's, um, the expectations that students are not congregating in residence halls, computer labs, et cetera. So I am curious about how do you expect students to do the work that they're being obligated to do? Sure, Representative Connolly, Mr. Chairman. Our information technology division has been connected to this issue since the spring. And so at that point in time, they arranged to get additional laptops available for students to have at need for the remainder of that semester. Many of those students returned those devices. We ensured that we acquired additional resources. And so we have on hand laptop computers that students can make requests to use during this period and beyond if necessary, so that we can ensure they are able to get their coursework completed. So aside from our, our faculty really wanting to be responsive and supportive of students when they reach out with concerns, our IT team has also coordinated to make those resources available. Representative Paxton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> In the case of a pause, how are students uh, assured of getting a quality experience, educational experience, if they have a lab attached to the class? Mr. Chairman, Representative Paxson, I'll, I'll take that one. Um, uh, our faculty, unlike uh, where we were last March, where we had to pivot very quickly, we were reactive to that particular uh, uh, scenario and faculty scrambled, quite frankly, uh, to, to have experiences put online to complete the semester. Uh, our faculty have been working extremely hard uh, over the course of the summer. The El Bogan Center for Teaching and Learning has uh, had many, many trainings. Uh, we've had hundreds of faculty participating in those trainings to help them prepare uh, for the fall. They knew going into the fall, even before we had to switch to the phase program, that we would be pivoting to fully online the week of Thanksgiving and beyond. And once the, the phase program was announced, then of course they knew the first phase, everything would be online as well. So our science uh, faculty have taken a multiple uh, uh, different approaches to how they flip their classrooms, how they redesign the space and how they redesign the actual experiences. And so in, in some cases, uh, for example, our, our uh, life sciences or basic biology, they have completely redesigned the laboratory experiences to have virtual opportunities in those experiences. Some of our other uh, 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 science-based courses uh, are looking at how they can um, shift the information, the learning that takes place so that when we're online, they uh, uh, provide the instruction that is appropriate for virtual delivery. And then uh, for the face-to-face -face experiences, they're going to redesign when and, and, and what 
is provided during those experiences. So it's a very important question and it's one that our faculty in those areas have really been working on a lot. In our College of Engineering, of course, uh, they have a number of face-to-face -face kinds of experiences as well and, and they are utilizing all sorts of technologies uh, to ensure that the student uh, students learn and, and develop the skills they need for uh, for those purposes. And it's not just in our sciences, in our performing arts and others that are, are very, uh, you know, very face-to-face uh, -face oriented. They are doing uh, many uh, uh, really creative and innovative uh, sorts of experiences during the times that students are learning virtually. Okay, other questions? Please proceed. Uh, President Seidel. Yes, uh, I think we have one last slide that Alex Keene will uh, speak to. Okay, Alex, go ahead. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, committee, the last slide here is just kind of a, a quick overview of the CARES Act funding that has come to the University of Wyoming. <clears throat> um, this, this matches the information provided earlier uh, by uh, Lachelle Brandt in the governor's office, but the 47.1 million is the direct COVID uh, relief funds from the 1.25 billion uh, through the governor's office. It's split uh, basically three ways. 26.5 million is uh, falls into to four buckets, our testing program, technology, our PPP, PPE and enhanced cleaning protocols, and then a pedagogical overhaul uh, bucket. Um, we're spending through those dollars at a, a pretty good pace right now. The second big piece of that is the $20 million for the CARES Wyoming Grant Fund Program. Um, we note here that 7,250 students have applied for those grants. Of that, 57% of those applicants are undergraduate Wyoming residents. And then the last piece is uh, 600,000 for the Trailblazer Program, uh, the Adult Worker uh, Program. And we've had 479 individuals apply for that program at the university. Um, that, that program is also at the community colleges and um, we just have a portion of that trailblazer program at the university. Uh, the second bucket, the university did receive 6.6 .6 million uh, directly in the higher education emergency relief fund. 3.3 million of that went directly to students last spring. The remaining 3.3 million uh, is for institutional support um, we have not identified or earmarked where that 3.3 million will be distributed, but I uh, anticipate that that will be discussed at the trustees meeting in September. Um, other units on campus have applied for other federal grants. Uh, those total about $5.8 million um, spread across a number of places uh, with different um, principal investigators uh, controlling those funds. The biggest piece of that I can say uh, actually relates to public transit operating funds and we're a sub recipient through the Wyoming Department of Transportation. And that's about uh, just under $2 million of those funds. Happy to answer any questions. You have questions of Alex? Okay, thank you very much. Anything else on UW? So Mr. Chairman, this is Ed Seidel. I'd just like to uh, say thanks for your time. We're happy to answer more questions. Uh, this is a result of many, many weeks, months really, of roughly a dozen working groups and, and literally a, a more than a couple of hundred people working around the clock to prepare for this situation that we're in. And I'm actually I'm quite proud of the team, given all the moving parts and, and the, the many hours that people have had to put into this. Uh, I think we're ready for about as well prepared as any university you could find. So thank you. Thank you, President Seidel, for all you've done since you came here, which was Maybe not the best time to come, but welcome. <laughs> I'm happy Where's to be Brown. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I, just one more piece of, um, I, I guess, observance. Um, I've, I had two two constituents that had students that were heading over there, um, and they were waiting and they were expressing frustration to me up until I think probably the day before the day of classes starting, and or moving into the dorms uh, was one of them. And there was little to no communication. And I was going to say something at, during the communication portion of this. Um, it, you know, I I just told them to kind of hold out, and things would things would come forward, and and they did. Um, so I, I do appreciate that you guys have a lot on your plates. There's a lot of moving parts and pieces going on here. So I, I respect that, and that's why I, I didn't intervene at the time. But 
Um, what I will say is the, the, the email that came out asking for money at the exact same time um, from the university, uh, optics on that were, were a little rough um, for some of those people that sending their, their students over the hill to pay, um, pay their tuition and they're not getting the information that they need. Uh, but in the same exact breath, they're getting an email asking them to uh, continue to fund the university on top of their tuition and assistance. So uh, not much of a question, just a little bit of a, a, just kind of a something that the optics from the outside world, just 45 miles away that you guys may not see, um, that, that most definitely some of my constituents did, and they made sure I was aware of it, um, just to kind of give you guys an idea that sometimes you know, asking for money right up front, right at the beginning of a school year, because we're all penny pension is probably not the best idea. Your President Seidel, would you like to respond? I would. Th thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Representative Brown, uh, thanks for that comment. Uh, I've heard a couple of comments along the same lines. Uh, they've been taken in and we're working hard to communicate. Of course, there are a lot of different communication streams going out. We're actually working very, very hard now to make sure that we're consistent and haven't tripped over ourselves one way or another. So thank you very much. I appreciate that. And again, my understanding is you guys have a lot of things going on. So not, not meant as a horrible criticism, just, just bringing it to the attention. Thank you. Okay, any other comments on UW update that we just got? Any further comments? Okay, thank you all from the university, President Seidel, everybody, and uh, appreciate your input today to the Joint Education Committee. Thank you very much. Okay, the next uh, on our agenda, in the last part of our agenda, update on Wyoming Community Colleges as it relates to COVID-19 pandemic. I see Dr. Caldwell and I see President Hickswa, Larry, Larry Buckholz. Uh, who would like to proceed? Sandy? Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, um, I am Sandy Caldwell, Executive Director of the Wyoming Community College Commission. Joining me today is Mr. Larry Buckholz. He is our uh, Chief Financial Officer. And then, of course, Dr. Stephanie Hickswa, President of Northwest College and also uh, president of the President's Council. Um, we're gonna give you a broad uh, overview and we'll get into the detail of the numbers. However, Dr. Hickswa does have an event this evening. And um, if, we, if you would uh, allow us, she's going to be sharing really the boots on the ground experience of what that's like for the colleges. And then Mr. Buckles and I will be sharing um, really uh, the broader uh, picture of what this all looks like. We're not going to go into the seven colleges in detail or we'll be here all night, but um, if I may, I would like to let Dr. Hickswa uh, get started with the experience at the college campus so that she can head on to her event. Yeah, Dr. Thank Hickswa, you. welcome. Go Thank ahead. you. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Thank you, Dr. Caldwell. I am Stephanie Hickswa, and as Dr. Caldwell said, I'm the president of Northwest College and the president of the Wyoming Community College Presidents Council. All of our plans are a little bit different, but all of them are very similar to some of the components that UW just discussed. Because we each serve different communities which have different populations coming to our campuses, our plans have had to be specific for our colleges. I too, like Dr. Seidel, am very appreciative of the around the clock work of my team. And as Dickie Shaner mentioned earlier, we could not have done this without our partnership with public health, our local hospital and our state partners. Along the lines of testing, I, I wanted to let you know that Northwest College decided rather to go with testing on campus because we do not have a health service, we partnered with public health and public health in the hospital is performing that for us. It's working very well. We have had one case since the college opened that was reported to me late on Monday night and we've taken care of that and offered the support services that were needed. We have procedures in place, much like what UW described. It's based on a board approved plan. 
Northwest College is operating in tier two, as was described by Mr. Shaner. What that means is that our college is operating in a hybrid model. Some components of our campus are open and some components of our campus are being delivered virtually. We are delivering our coursework in three different modalities. Our regular online coursework, which we offer every semester, is still being offered. We are offering many of our lecture courses via Zoom, just like what we're doing today. And we're offering our lab courses and welding courses and nursing clinicals, equine studies. We are offering them live. We did open our residence halls, but we encourage students to stay home if they were able to, if their classes were all through Zoom, or if they wanted to live at home. We normally have a requirement for freshmen to live on campus during their first year, and we have waived that requirement for this year. Like UW, our athletic programs have been delayed until spring with the exception of rodeo. We will be continuing our rodeo program in the fall. Our rodeo coach told me that rodeo is a contact sport, but it isn't so much um, person to person. So they have the protocols in place from the Cody Stampede from this summer, so we're fine. I am very pleased with how our opening has gone. It's well exceeded my expectations, but my team told me, yeah, but Stephanie, your expectations weren't very high. <laughs> so we, we've just done really well with this process. Our population is, is very small at Northwest College and we are serving our students the best that we can. What we are planning to do if we have an incident of cases that exceeds our capacity or the capacity of our healthcare system, we are planning to close rather than pause, much like we did in the spring. Since so many of our courses are offered via Zoom, we are able to do that. Hopefully, we would be able to leave our residence halls open so that students wouldn't have to transition their housing but then all of the coursework would be transitioned to Zoom or online. Like UW, all of the community colleges are planning to go online or via Zoom, so remote learning after Thanksgiving. With that, I, I will close by saying that the protocols in place that we have for cleaning has been a heavy lift. Staffing is challenging for cleaning staff uh, of what we need. But we know on campus that if we stay the course, we can stay open. And we're communicating to the students over and over that they need to mask up and follow our on-campus mask requirement, that they need to back up and maintain social distancing, that they need to wash up and maintain good hygiene and wash their hands frequently, and they need to check up by doing a daily health check every day to monitor their symptoms. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll now turn it back to Dr. Caldwell. Okay, thank you, President uh, Hickswa. Okay. Dr. Mr. Caldwell, go ahead. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, I'm going to share my screen uh, because there's a, if I can, uh, if I can get this onto the website because I think this will help um, the approach and to help everyone see. So um, I, I just wanna start off with uh, recognizing that the impacts of COVID-19 and what this uh, does for our state is, uh, is an impact for educational attainment and is certainly an impact for um, the economic vitality of the, of the state. And that is something that's been talked about um, throughout uh, the country for the impact of this, particularly uh, around the concern for a gap year that students may be taking, which then has ripple effects to the economy. Um, I wanted to mention that because we do have um, the strategic plan for the co uh, community college uh, system. Uh, and that'll actually, the draft of it's going to be public on Friday. Um, we'll have a feedback period for that. And I think that's really important because it uh, really highlights the impact of uh, post-secondary education and economic development uh, for the state of Wyoming. 
So uh, moving on to the CARES or to the COVID-19 and impacts for that, uh, you heard from Superintendent Balo this morning and then you heard from uh, Chief Shaner and Miss um, uh, Brandt that we did have an education task force uh, really talking about how to navigate the impacts of COVID-19 for the entire education system. We actually also had family services as a part of that. Um, and it was a very impactful uh, for the university, I believe that was Mr. or Dr. Theobald. And that was very impactful because it led us, it got us moving very, very quickly uh, to uh, respond. Beginning in April, uh, very beginning of April, I actually um, established a weekly uh, standing meeting with the president along with the attorney general, particularly as the guidance was coming out from the U.S. Treasury on the state funds. And that was so that we could identify what the issues uh, really were, for the colleges and, and the challenges around the impacts and how to respond. Uh, and it also helped us prepare and prep for uh, the CARES funds. Um, I, I will share with you that publicly available on the commission website, we had updates in April, uh, June, and actually last week uh, for uh, COVID-19 and the CARES funds for the colleges. Um, some, I believe it was in the beginning of June, we also had a joint meeting with Dr. Harris uh, and the Department of Health with the colleges and the university talking about uh, putting together the reopening plans for the institutions. So what I want to show you on this website right now, and I think you can all see this, uh, we did stand up a web page that combines the information for all seven of the community colleges uh, in one location so that it was easily accessible. Um, on this site is, um, the protocol guidance, uh, but what I wanted to draw your attention to is that all seven of the um, community college reopening plans are on this website, and we actually included a link to the university as well because we knew that individuals would be coming at all different um, from all different points, wanting to know where to look, and we wanted to create an easy stop, uh, one stop shop uh, for this. So one, one of the things I wanna uh, highlight is that the colleges incorporated and in the guidance that is there, the CDC guidelines and then the phased reopening of America that was put out by the Trump administration that has the mitigation, re-entry and reopening. That's why you see a very common theme uh, throughout uh, the institutions. This included what you heard from Dr. Hickswa and that is the ability to manage rolling closures. So if at any point they need to close the campuses, uh, they have a plan for that. All of the colleges do have incident command as, um, activities set up on the colleges. And I'm very pleased to report that it's working. Um, that has really shown itself in the last two weeks with the colleges that as soon as something comes up, they are able uh, to respond immediately. So all seven of those reopening plans were uh, before their boards of trustees. And we in fact used these plans as part of the substantiation and documentation for the care state funds that were ultimately submitted. And, and frankly, we continue uh, to refine. Um, I will mention that in the, um, the, when the campuses had to close in March, some of the colleges did have to move forward with exception requests and countywide waivers, uh, but they did that in, in very close contact with um, their county health officer and the state health officer. So I wanna, they were able to complete all the student learning outcomes that were required, including for their hands-on courses. When you talk about, as you heard Dr. Hickswa say, and um, you can't really complete dental hygiene without being in a uh, uh, team and mouths, so it, it, it's an important component. Um, I will also, I wanted to share that um, it's not it, it quite simple and that's why they're all slightly different. And, and I think that's not so dissimilar from what you heard from Department of Ed, but even in the colleges, they have multiple locations and how they have to address their reopening and the approvals that they needed to get from the county health officers vary depending on 
on the incident, how Eastern might approach um, their mitigation and reopening plan um, might vary might be very different from how Central Wyoming College needs to do that. And then when you add to that Central Wyoming College, how they might need to manage that with a county health officer uh, in, in Fremont County is very different from how they might need to navigate that and work through the reopening for Teton County. Uh, so they worked very, very closely and the ability to do that at the local level, I think was, um, really shows in their plans and their ability to adapt uh, and respond. Um, on this webpage, uh, what I also wanna show you is uh, just some really great examples. Uh, uh, Casper College, for example, is working with the Natrona County Health and they're doing the drive-through testing at the college campus. And then I also wanted to share some of the innovative approaches that the colleges have taken. We have an entire site uh, around this on how the colleges were able to uh, really adapt um, the student learning outcomes and, 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 and meet completion. There's commencement with Dr. Tyndall uh, there, how they were able to get that done in such a complex uh, situations. And they started that in March. They actually adapted very quickly and then um, they uh, continue to do so now as they've really prepped for uh, potential rolling closures. I also wanna add that we participated in multiple uh, meetings with, at the state level with the US Department of Education and the White House as well on the opening of the post-secondary institutions. We actually have another one related to uh, the rapid testing that you heard about um, I think earlier today, we have that meeting tomorrow with, uh, with the White House and the uh, department jointly with the uh, US Department of, of Education. In terms of the CARES funds, and I, I wanna switch to that for just a moment. We talked about that a little bit in June um, in recognizing that there were some state funds uh, there were institutional funds, and then there were also the GEAR funds that you heard uh, Ms. Brandt talk about. And we've actually provided that summary uh, to uh, LSO, what we initially reported, and then Mr. Buckles is going to go through uh, the status of that right now, because I think that's very important for you to be aware of. Um, the GEAR, or excuse me, the CARES funds happened in uh, really three uh, components of funds, and we've talked about all of them today, but I wanted to be very clear on the three parts of that. There's the ed education stabilization funds of the CARES funds, which is separate from the state CARES funds. Those funds were separated uh, into the different components that you heard about today. You had the ESSER funds, you had the GEAR funds, and you had the HERF funds. So for the colleges out of the ed education stabilization, there were two components that were important uh, to note. And that is the HER funds, the higher education uh, funds, and then the, uh, the GEAR funds. We did provide a summary of that. Uh, you heard the university got about 6.6 .6 million in the HER funds, higher education emergency response funds. Um, the community colleges got 6.5 of that uh, total. And then that was divided into so across the colleges, 3.2 million, 2.5, 3.25 million had to go to students, 3.25 million had to go to the colleges, and they went directly to the colleges. I'm going to tell you that was exhausted almost immediately when the colleges did the prorated funds back to the students for uh, housing and meals. Uh, that was not uh, permitted to take from the student funds, it had to come from the institutional funds. So um, that's where the gear was very important. That was used to help uh, the colleges immediately respond to the needs of converting to online coursework. And that's where that uh, million dollars is. And we've got another half of that. Those funds have a longer timeline as you heard today than the state CARES funds do. And I think that's an important. So we had the HER funds, which were exhausted almost immediately and um, pretty much with the return of funding to students 
for their housing and meals, and then the GEARS funding that helped us stand up, helped the colleges stand up, um, the, uh, the, the change to online very quickly. And then the third part that I that I'm going to let Mr. Buckles talk about here in just a moment are the state funds. And we worked on that very, very intentionally from the very beginning as we were tracking the CARES uh, funds. It did carry forward Title IV requirements, um, but then the flexibility of the state then followed the US Treasury guidance. And that's where we had to, to follow through. Um, I will share that there was extensive cost to the colleges. Uh, and, and I just wanna be very, very clear on the overall cost, not to mention what we were concerned about with the drop of enrollment due to the gap year. Um, and we, we have a request in that, and I'll talk about that in just a moment, that has really helped. And we're seeing that in the enrollment reports that we did uh, just yesterday. This is where we made significant requests, and I just counted them up. There were 22 requests across the colleges, um, there, uh, and then also for the Post-Secondary Educational Attainment Council, that's the adult grant that you heard, and then also for the commission, which is where we had, uh, for example, adult education uh, lives. So um, within that, that you did hear about the adult grant, uh, that was seven and a half uh, million, and then the Wyoming College Grant, which um, for the community college side of it, including uh, YO Tech, we are included in both of those, is 20, uh, 20 million at this time. So um, the commission did take action last Friday to adopt the emergency rules for both the adult grant and the college grant because it required that in order to implement the processes. Uh, so it, it's, it's, and I have some detail around that, but I wanna let Mr. Buckles go through that actual uh, document of the funding so that you can see that in front of you. And then I can share what we've already seen in terms of headcount, FTE, and the velocity of that enrollment due to the passage of those two big uh, grants. So if I may, Mr. Buckles. Go ahead, Mr. Buckholz. Thank you, Dr. Caldwell. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, if I could get the LSO, Ms. Vaughn, to bring up 1401. Um, thank you very much. Um, what you have before here on this, on this slide, or actually it's an Excel spreadsheet, um, is a little bit more granular detail of what you saw earlier in the afternoon from Ms. Grant, um, and very similar to what you saw from um, Mr. Keene. Um, at UW. Um, I'll just go down the list pretty quickly. Um, I, would, I will point out that the community colleges had the option to request CARES Act funding directly through the process, through the budget office. They could have all acted independently and quite frankly, it would have deluged the system. So we acted as a conduit at the community college commission to gather all of their requests and make it a cohesive request um, on their behalf. So we did that for the colleges. The top four um, priorities that you see are requests specifically put in by the Community College Commission. Um, number one there was from the commission itself. It was a tuition and fee waiver intended to allow students to retake the spring semester at no cost if they were um, unsatisfied with the outcome of um, their instruction or their grade um, as a result of transitioning everything to a virtual environment. Um, that, that request has not been approved. Um, we don't have that funding to um, offer that to students in the fall semester. And quite frankly, it's a little too late to act on it now. Um, the other three requests dealt with technology and um, adult education and the adult education centers that we administer um, through the adult ed program at the commission level. The next two priorities, EAEC number one and number two, um, dealt primarily with um, what was a $15 million request for dislocated, dislocated or displaced adult workers um, to come back and um, retool, retrain, um, add to their training. 
to, to supplement um, their employment opportunities. The decision was made um, so at some point during the process that we could only use this money for the fall semester. So that's why it's cut in half. Originally, our request was to cover the entire 2021 academic year, um, but this money cannot be used, um, as you all know, past 30 December. So um, that request was cut in half. That $7.5 million, as Dr. Caldwell has already said, and uh, Ms. Brent probably said, um, cover students attending the seven community colleges, UW and YL Tech. Um, so um, we're, 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 the, we're running herd on that one and keeping track of, of what's been obligated and what's going out the door so that um, we don't exceed that allocation. So that's how that's all going along. The other request from the Educational Attainment Council was to do a gap analysis. Um, there's a company that we've hired in the past that has done this for us in the past, but it's dated information. So we thought it was beneficial to do a gap analysis of the higher education system to show where there's a disconnect between industry needs and what regional or community colleges are delivering in, the, in terms of training um, to determine where things might be bolstered a little bit to um, address those needs in different communities. That, that again, just hasn't been, um, hasn't been approved by the governor's office. The next series of requests, those 15, are 15 that we put in on behalf of the community colleges collectively. Um, each community college has input into each one of these priorities, and part of the funding that has been allocated has gone to each one of them. I can go down the list, but I really would just like to focus on those that have been approved um, and the money that is out the door. It's a little bit, again, more granular than what Ms. Brandt showed you a little bit earlier in the afternoon. But we received funding through the CARES Act and through approval of both the governor's office and the attorney general's office. Community college priority number three, which dealt extremely um, pointedly at those three sentences that are um, to the left of that priority. Expenses related to course delivery modality, what they had to do back in March when they closed their campuses down, the cost of virtual graduation, computers for both students, staff, and faculty to transition all of that work to that virtual modality. Um, conversion to telework for staff. Uh, I mean, they really jumped through hoops when we shut campuses down and, and that $10.4 million is real expenses. Those are expenses that went out the door to be able to facilitate closing those campuses down as, as a result of the um, executive health orders. We got all but $13,000 of that. So um, that money really replenishes um, what the colleges, like I said, really had capital outlay for to make things happen. The next um, priority, number four, our original request, $10.154 million. During the time in between when we had to put these in the system, which was May the 15th, and when the governor's office actually acted on them, we continued to refine our numbers. Um, and the colleges continued to work to make sure that there was no expenses or no anticipated expenses that would be included in two of these different buckets. Well, as we did that work, there was about $300,000 that was included in multiple places within our request, resulting in us having to um, rework and, and decrease the amount we asked for in this bucket. And we got that. And that really all, um, again, deals with technology issues at the campuses and continuing to provide a conduit for faculty and student interaction in the remote learning environment, um, standing up hotspots across their community, not just on their campuses, um, to allow students to to access it, to um, you know, get an internet connection and to be, be able to do their coursework um, on a laptop, um, which in a lot of cases, the college has provided to those students and to faculty and to staff um, to facilitate everything that happened when we shut those campuses down. Priority number six, um, 
I, I will talk about this one. This one really has been supplemented. Um, we weren't able to do it as a lost revenue request because lost revenue is not eligible for CARES Act funding because the community colleges are pseudo, pseudo governmental entity, so it's not allowed. But just the fact that the governor approved the 20 million CARES Wyoming grant and the 7.5 million in the attainment uh, council's request for dislocated and displaced workers, adult workers, um, it's taken care of that. Um, the colleges are not realizing, and Dr. Caldwell will share this with you when I'm done, that they really didn't, they're really not experiencing the enrollment decrease in the fall semester that was anticipated. Um, so that request, it wasn't approved because it was a lost revenue request, but it's been mitigated by other funding sources. Um, wages attributed to COVID-19, community college number seven. I, as a change to this slide, I received word late yesterday afternoon that that $1.4 million was approved. Um, again, this is one of those requests that we continued to work on after the original submission date, and it resulted in a $2 million decrease in um, what the colleges were really asking for and what was eligible for reimbursement um, in the opinion of the Attorney General. So we're good there. Then there's a few that have not been approved, um, and primarily they have dealt with lost revenue um, or other expenses that just they just don't rise to the to the need. I think that um, um, the governor's office and the attorney general is looking at um, as an expense to come out of that 1.25 billion dollars. Then we get down to the CARES Wyoming College Grant Program. The slide says 25 million. You might remember Miss Brandt said it was 20 million with 5 million in reserve. That's what that 25 million dollars is. Um, that is meant to provide food and housing security for students attending the community colleges in Wyotech. Uh, that's its primary um, source of funding to do that for students. Um, and, it, and it has brought a lot of students back to campus, or should I say, it has caused a lot of students to enroll in the fall semester um, very late in the game, if you will. Um, and like I said, Dr. Caldwell will, will entertain that here in a minute. And then we had a request in for child care centers. Four of our college campuses have early learning her child's child care centers on their campuses. And there was a specific provision within treasury guidance that allowed for child care centers to receive aid. And that aid was all distributed through family services. The colleges weren't part of that distribution. So we submitted it independent of um, what family services doled out to other private child care centers. Um, that one is approved by the governor's office. We're waiting for a determination on a final approval from the attorney general's office. And if we get that, we'll, we'll certainly send that out. Then there's a little section of the gear fund. Um, I think you've heard enough about it. Um, that was the allocation for that money. And like uh, Ms. Brandt said, it went to the seven community colleges and the Carver County Higher, Higher Education Center at, um, in Rollins. And then adult education, a, a division of the Community College Commission received 29,000, specifically used to address technology needs at the adult education deliveries. So that's, again, a pretty high level of what we have done and how much money has been granted to the colleges and um, what its intended purpose is. I'd stand for any questions. Questions of uh, Mr. Mr. Buckles. Any questions? Okay, Dr. Caldwell, do you want to proceed? Or are you? Uh, do you have more for us? Yes, sir, Mr. Uh, Chairman, I do, and members of the committee. I know we've gone very fast. We're watching the clock uh, because you had laid down that you thought we might get out early, and I want to help you with that. But. <laughs> I, I do want to share uh, a little bit about the enrollment. Now, this is this is not final enrollment. Um, and I the question had come up is, if we put this kind of funding in place uh, uh, through the adult grant and through the college uh, grant, will it in fact do what, what we were hoping it would do? We have not closed the gap on enrollment, but it has certainly uh, diminished and we did see a very specific impact related to these grants 
uh, that that is telling us that that it has it is working. It is having an impact. There will be more. The colleges have a backlog right now. The, the financial aid offices are working incredibly uh, fast and a lot of overtime to try to get these in. But let me give you a snapshot from when we last reported to Wyoming's tomorrow on July 31st to yesterday. With, both, with headcount, FTE, and velocity, because that was a specific question we got. Enrollment always increases getting closer to the semester, particularly for community colleges. But did that, did the pace of that over time increase? And the answer is yes, uh, definitely related to this funding. So uh, in mid-July, I will be very honest, we had some of the colleges that were down in excess of 20% and at 30%. It was pretty at pretty high level at that July 9th, um, Wyoming's tomorrow. July 31st, that had uh, dropped to, there was still a 16% deficit in headcount and a 17% deficit in, in FTE, which meant the students who were there were not taking as many classes. As of yesterday, that had narrowed down to an only an 8%, so we've closed that gap by 8% uh, for headcount, we're down 8% but FTE is down 7%. So now what we're seeing is they are taking more uh, credits and we are hearing directly from the students that it did have to do with costs, that their families are impacted by um, an income loss related to uh, COVID-19. Uh, so a few things that I think are really helpful to illustrate this is, oh, I'm gonna throw out Casper College as an example. Their headcount enrollment was down 11%. Uh, and now they have no decrease. And that's really significant. And they're actually up on FTE. Western over in Rock Springs, um, very large service area, they were down in headcount 19%. They are now up 2%. That's a 21% that's a uh, delta. What really is telling is the velocity of the change from last year to this year. So was it the funding that triggered this? And, and I'm gonna tell you, yes, um, and it is statistically significant in that in 2019, that velocity going into the semester was 27%. It is now at 36%. And that means the rate of individuals enrolling coming into the, that semester after that funding was announced definitely had an impact uh, from, from uh, 731 to 831. So we'll track that again in, in the next couple of weeks. Significant notables, Casper College, they went from a 16% velocity to a 38%. Western, not surprisingly, since they, their delta was 22% on enrollment, they went from a 29% to a 67% velocity. Definitely an, an impact to both of these uh, sets of funds. And so it, just knowing that that, uh, that implementation very quickly had um, a, a, an impact on students' lives around the kitchen table uh, in, in our homes across the state is something uh, to note. So with that, um, I, I would ha be happy to stand for any questions. I know it is five o'clock and I'm gonna end it right now. Questions of Dr. Caldwell, any questions? Okay, Dr. Caldwell, thank you. Appreciate very much the input. Thank you, President Hickswa, Mr. Buckholz. And uh, now we'll go to the public comment section. I would uh, remind everybody that this last agenda item, you know, the four different bullet points uh, are only updates. Uh, this committee will be taking no action on any of these. And so I'd ask that uh, if at all possible that you'd be as brief as possible. I see my good friend Richard Garrett there. So please go ahead, whoever wants to go first. Public comment. Let's, Richard, if you'd unmute so we can hear you. You're very kind, Mr. Chairman. It's great to see you all. Um, and I am going to try to be brief. I'll pare my 30 minutes of remarks down to about 30 seconds. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Co-Chairman, and committee members. My name is Richard Garrett. And I thank you for allowing me to quickly share my thoughts with you on this agenda item. 
I live in Lander where with my wife and our blended family, we have raised two children. As parents of an incoming freshman, I want to thank the University of Wyoming and President Seidel and his team for their extraordinary work to bring students back safely to campus. The university's communications with and outreach to parents and students has been, from our point of view, outstanding. We have received regular updates on how the university will proceed, and it is clear to us that everyone at UW is working with common purpose and a singular focus on how best to continue to provide exceptional learning opportunities and to navigate safely through very difficult circumstances. Our daughter moves onto campus this Saturday, having spent the last two weeks in a virtual learning environment. Think of this through her eyes if you can. She is so incredibly excited, but she's also assured us that she is committed to adhering to the university's guidance and is excited to begin her college career within those boundaries on the campus at University of Wyoming. I also want to thank Governor Gordon and the legislature for identifying and providing funding resources to offset UW's costs to safely open and also for incentivizing students to return to school. To that latter point, just a bit ago and literally less than an hour ago, our daughter let us know that she has received a grant from the State of Wyoming CARES College Grant Funding Program. That's the program Alex King referred to in his slide. In his slide. So again, our profound thanks. On another note, both personal and professional, I've had the privilege to know and work in a variety of ways and on a variety of issues with the members of this committee. I admire your work on behalf of Wyoming and your dedication to your constituents. I want to say too that the committee chair and co-chair have always been dedicated to doing all that they can for our state's educational system. Your work helped our daughter and thousands like her earn Hathaway scholarships and for that I am also grateful. It may interest you to know 70% of the 2020 graduating class at Fremont County School District number one, that's in Lander, plans to attend college this fall. The graduates will be going to many, many colleges and universities, including Central Wyoming College, Casper College, Western, LCCC, Northwest Wyoming, and of course, the University of Wyoming. Some will be going out of state to places like Stanford, Princeton, Yale, and a few even to Colorado State University. Something a bit painful, but I think that state needs cowboys and cowgirls too. And something else that is exciting, the class of 2020 applied for and earned over $2 million in scholarships, a record. And that means they have leveraged the state's investment in their education to what will one day be our state's benefit. And speaking of public education and higher learning, a solid education leads to a lifetime of learning, and that leads to an inquisitiveness that means a person can analyze complex and competing ideas more effectively without relying on social media, I might add. So my thanks to the Fremont County School District number one, all of its teachers, its superintendent Dave Barker, school board president Brett Berg, and his fellow board members, and to Brad Neuendorf, the principal at Lander Valley High School. In conclusion, I'm honored to know you, the members of the Joint Education Committee, as friends and look forward to seeing you all again, in particular, your retiring members, Chairman Coe, Chairman Northrop, and Representatives Speeperinen and Freeman in the time to come. In the meantime, I thank each of you for all of your service to our beautiful state. And those are my remarks, Mr. Chair. Well, thank you very much, Richard. We'll miss being with you as well. I can thank tell you, Richard. You. Any any questions of Richard? Okay, thank you very much, Richard. You're you're very kind. Michelle Hoffman. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm sure everyone's just about spent right about now. Thank you for allowing me a few minutes of your time today to share with you some of the things that has taken for my school district to open a closed tier. Um, my name is Michelle Hoffman, and I'm the interim again superintendent at Fremont County School District 14, Wyoming Indian Schools. Uh, located in the heart of the Wind River Indian Reservation. I'd like to share with you a few numbers of the COVID cases in, um, in Fremont County as this information will help you understand why my school board voted unanimously to open in a virtual setting. 
As of Wednesday, yesterday, there have been 536 confirmed cases of COVID and 69 probable cases in Fremont County. The number of deaths due to COVID has been 14. Over three fourths of our students live in either a household which consists of grandparents or elderly relatives, or they're being raised by their grandparents. This puts the elderly population at risk for contract contacting this disease. <clears throat> Due to the high numbers of confirmed cases, the deaths and the Wind River Intertribal Council resolution stay at home orders, my board of trustees made that decision to open in a closed tier for at least the first quarter. I could talk for hours as to the planning needed to do such a task, but I'll keep my comments short and hopefully sweet. We began looking at our facilities and two of our buildings are very old and the needed sinks for hand washing were not available. So we ordered 33 portable hot cold water sinks to accommodate when students do come back to school. We upgraded our ventilation system to, you, uh, to include UV filters to help filter the incoming air to the buildings. We partnered with AmeriClean Sanitizing Company to provide complete disinfecting and sanitizing of our school buildings and vehicles. And just these few things cost our district well over $242,000, which we had not anticipated and actually has nothing to do with educating our students. Our staff returned to work on August 12th and we needed our PPEs for them to return safely. Our district purchased face mask shields, hand sanitizers and thermometers so they could return. We certainly appreciate the state purchasing PPE for districts. However, the timing receiving this equipment didn't match with when our staff returned. Our first, sh first shipment was re uh, received on August 24th, 12 days after our staff were already here. In the last 16 days, staff have been back to work. 14 <clears throat> have been sent home for close contact quarantine, and we had one positive um, COVID case. In other words, 10% of our staff have been sent home for at least 10 days already. Technology is another item we had to deal with. 95% of our students do not have access to the internet or Wi-Fi. And in order to do a virtual education, we needed to address this right away. Our district has purchased uh, hotspots with the governor's technology monies available, but probably won't be able to access that money for our Chromebooks. The shortage in the United States has put the availability of these products out three to four months. And if we don't have the products in our hands as of December 30th, we lose the availability to use these federal funds. Before our staff ever reported to work, we get, began planning on how to keep everyone socially distanced, but still get the work done to prepare for teaching our students virtually. Our staff would work really, really hard. Virtual teaching is something most teachers aren't adapt at. And we knew we needed intense training to ensure our students would be getting the best possible education. We upfronted our professional development days for teachers and staff has spent many hours um, learning to plan lessons on Canvas and Zoom. Plans have been put into place to ensure our students receive hot cooked meals delivered directly to their homes. These are just a few of the many purchasing and planning things we have encountered. But for right now, we're just trying our best to exist in this new normal of education. And I thank you for your time today. Any, any questions or comments with uh, for Michelle? Senator Ellis, then we'll go to Representative Connolly and then Representative Flitner. Thank you, Mr. Three Chief. powerful women on this committee. <laughs> Briefly, your select committee on tribal relations will be meeting on Monday and Tuesday, September 14th and 15th. Um, we plan on devoting quite a bit of time to COVID discussion. So um, Superintendent Hoffman, um, if you don't mind maybe uh, checking in with us offline to see if it would be helpful for us to get an update in that venue as well. And then just one other side comment. I mean, COVID has hit Native America particularly hard. And you touch on one reason is you have a lot of people often living with grandparents and people who are older who are more susceptible to some of the more devastating re, um, effects of having COVID. But I mean, the, the problem's larger than that too. I think it's, you know, folks with pre-existing health conditions. And I think it's making America realize that Indian country, a lot of those uh, communities, they're just not simply, they don't have access to the healthcare they need. And it's an intergenerational problem when you start living these unhealthy lifestyles. So. Um, I just want to thank you for presenting today, but um, also just so you are aware that uh, we're going to also be looking at this too um, later on this month. Thank you, Senator Ellis. Representative Connolly. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Superintendent Hoffman, for your presentation. Honestly, it was pretty stark and compelling, um, the numbers that you were giving us and the, the realities that you're working with with your students. Um, earlier today, we heard a presentation from the Department of Ed, and in particular with some of their, what they're calling egress money. And uh, one of my concerns was that only 1% of that money has been pushed out to the, the districts at this point. And I'm just curious if you're getting the support that you need in order to access the funds that have been made available to the state through the feds. And if not, what is it that you could use help from us so that you can get access to that funding? Mr. Co-Chair. Michelle, go ahead. Um, Representative Connell, um, yeah, we have a very small staff, and um, as I said, I'm the interim. I came in on J July 1st, and we're scrambling to, as you heard earlier, the Title I um, um, plans are due, consolidated grants plans are due. Uh, we do have our plan put together. Um, unfortunately, <laughs> we've had some deaths in the um, my um, staff community, and so they have been out. Um, we plan on starting school with our kids on Tuesday and Wednesday, we're going to be applying for that money. So um, it is, we we uh, have our plans together. We just haven't gotten there. It's just been really, really overwhelming. It's not that it's uh, not an important thing. It is an important thing, but we are not gonna let that opportunity go by. I guarantee you that. <laughs> okay, Representative Flintner. Mr. Chairman, thank you. And I just wanted to thank Superintendent Hoffman for her presentation. I've connected um, with one of my schools and I know how very stressed our educators are and our administrators and what they have to deal with pales in comparison with what you all are dealing with there. And so I just want to encourage you and your staff and your team and um, everybody involved, families, children, and um, I just hope you'll keep us posted. And if there's any way we can do anything for you to try to, you know, waive some of the requirements or do, I don't know. I just feel like your situation, this situation is so unusual, but yours is highly unusual. And my heart goes out to you. And I just mm -hmm. encourage you all to keep up your very good work. Thank you. Thank you, Rep. Jenny Flitner. Any other questions or comments for Michelle Hoffman? Michelle, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Anybody else in the waiting room? Do we have any other testimony, public testimony? Okay, it's, uh, I got to tell you, it's 515 exactly. And I can tell you, I got it done right on time, as always. Maybe I'd, I'd been happier being a little bit early, but Matt, let's talk about uh, uh, next steps. And I know we don't have a meeting till November, uh, but uh, Matt, go ahead. Yeah, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the, the next meeting for this committee is uh, tentatively scheduled for November 17th and 18th. Uh, we have a few directives uh, that we'll work with uh, the chairman and, and some other members of the committee to, to proceed. I won't go through them right now, um, but uh, also this committee, as Representative Connolly indicated, uh, is also able to attend the uh, Select Committee on School Finance Recalibration on uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, September 8th and 9th. Uh, there is no salary for members, but they are allowed to claim per diem. Uh, so that's one of the, the distinctions with, with that. So um, with that, Mr. Chairman, I don't have any anything else. Anybody else have anything else for the good of the order? Representative Paxton. Thank you. Just a couple of comments, Mr. Chairman. Um, some of us uh, are not as fortunate as, uh, or maybe unfortunate, uh, is uh, 65 kids short of what they were last year. And uh, they attribute a lot of those to people who have elected to do online classes other than the ones that are offered by the school district themselves. And so that's a point of concern. I have two daughters that are both teachers, one in Arizona teaching second grade virtually and another teaching kindergarten here in encampment. I can tell you that we're very fortunate to have the dedicated people in the educational community here in Wyoming that have done such a great job of allowing our kids to have uh, in, in school uh, 
instruction, even though there's a lot of, of problems with that, um, especially in the, my, my uh, daughter teaches kindergarten here and uh, the mask thing is a real issue with them. You know, you got uh, nasal discharges and vomiting in the mask and the mask break and the masks get lost and following the protocol that is time consuming and that takes away from instructional time and we all have to recognize that so I'm not sure how long this the the, the uh, uh, we have to adhere to these protocols but I I'm telling you that it does have there is a toll on the on the uh, academic side as well as the as the uh, economic side of this thing so um, I also think that uh, we might want to start thinking ahead a little bit about I believe there's going to be quite a few people opt to take early retirement out of this thing, not just teachers, but probably other staff members. If you think about the pressure put on custodians, bus drivers, and other folks related to this uh, pandemic, um, I think we better start thinking a little bit about what we're going to do about filling some of those, those vacancies that are inevitable. Well, thank you. Very good comments, Rep. Jenny Paxton. Rep. Jenny Freeman. Uh, I would just, this is really late to ask this question, but if I would, I read several articles that they were uh, projecting up to 20% of teachers not returning this year, uh, that they're really worried about um, people coming back. I'd like to know a number if, if we've had that kind of uh, uh, no show among teachers because of this stressful situation. It can be sent out in an email. Thank you, Representative Freeman. Okay, anything else to come in front of the committee? Committee, thank you for your hard work today. We had a long day and, and you know, thank you, Co-Chair Northrup. And uh, we'll get together again in November, but probably see some of you or all of you, hopefully next week on Recal, which are uh, Tuesday and Wednesday. And I hope you'll, we've got a, I don't know, Chris, you know, Senator Office can see it too. I'm looking at my binder, it's, it's pretty thick and there's a lot of stuff in there, a lot of stuff in there for recal and there's gonna be a lot of active discussion. So I would encourage any of you that would like to sign into this to do it. And um, with that, Mr. Co-Chair, do you have any comments? None at all, you're doing a great job, thank you. Okay, committee, thank you for your hard work. We are adjourned and hopefully see you Tuesday and Wednesday on recap. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye, everybody. Bye, everybody.